Listen to The Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. I am Scott Philbrook, and I'm pointing the wrong way. Thank you for having me. When I think about medieval torture, it's just like, wow, the quartering seems like one of the worst. We tell each other stories over the fire at the pub. Is that the most uh, haunted place you would say in, in Essex or the most uh, active? Your skin was vibrating with it and there was dogs barking everywhere all around the village. And then it sort of built to a pitch and then just went vroom. It looked like a, a person, like a human being. It was a person. I'm going to disagree with that. I'm going to say werewolf. Astonishing Legends would like to thank Factor, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. In the tangled and complex history of humanity's relationship with unidentified objects, or aerial phenomena, if you prefer, there are certain pivotal moments etched deeply into the timeline. It would be naive to think that these strange encounters began in the 20th century. What about the peculiar celestial objects depicted in ancient paintings like the Madonna with St. Giovannino or the Crucifixion of Christ in Kosovo? Are they simply odd representations of angels? And that begs another question. Are we truly sure what angels are supposed to be? Fast forward to more recent times. The UFO phenomenon took a sharp turn in the mid-20th century evolving significantly from the 1940s all the way through to the Hudson Valley flap in the 80s. Now, it appears to be shifting once again, though at an agonizingly slow pace. Most of us are familiar with the strange happenings of Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Less might know the name Donald Kehoe, whose article, Flying Saucers Are Real, published in True Magazine in January 1950, later became a best-selling book. Then there's Truman Bathurum, a man with a story that's quite literally out of this world. In the small hours of the night, half asleep in his truck after a hard day's work, a swarm of small humanoid beings woke him up. They bustled around his vehicle, chattering in an indecipherable language. Near them hovered a colossal saucer, a burnished steel disc measuring an astonishing 300 feet across and six yards deep at its center. It defied logic and gravity, suspended in air without any visible means of support. This wasn't a fever dream or the plot of a sci-fi novel. This was Truman's reality, as detailed in his relatively obscure book, Aboard a Flying Saucer. But it gets even stranger. Truman claimed to have been aboard this flying saucer, not once, but 11 times. He recounted encounters with beings from another world with such detail and conviction that it gave one pause. Bathurum's story faced skepticism and outright disbelief, but he never wavered about the events. He shared the hardships he endured from skeptics and described his interactions with the alleged captain of the saucer. So, strap in folks. As we delve into the enigma of Truman Bathurum and his extraordinary claims, remember this. The truth is often far stranger than fiction. Welcome to another episode of Astonishing Legends. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. If I am found dead in my bed, it will be because my heart is stopped from the terrible excitement induced by seeing and going aboard a flying saucer. Truman Bathurum. Join us tonight for part one of an astonishing discussion with special guests Richard Haddam and Rob Christopherson about Truman Bathurum's bizarre multiple close encounters in 1952. <laughs> And we're back. Oh, is that that's your 1950s movie voice, isn't it? That I is like my that. 1950s trailers voice. If you could picture a uh, type uh, smearing, wiping across the screen. You know? I always think about the newsreels, the march of time. Time oh, marches on. Voice. That's a different voice I do. Yes, we are back, folks. Thanks for joining us again. Um, what do we got going on tonight? Well, folks, we have a terrific show for you tonight. A lot of interesting conversation as we can only have with our two good pals, Rich and Rob, especially about this topic. And everybody had some really interesting insights. I know it's a little vintagey, but we haven't really done that uh, since Orfeo Angelucci. 
And this is really, all the, as all this stuff is unfolding currently on social media and in the news, uh, it's important, I think, for us to take a look back at one of the major pivotal moments. Man, what it must have been like to have been alive in 1952, if you were paying attention. Yeah, there was a, a lot of wild stuff happening. And as Forrest said, Rich and Rob are with us, which is so great. We're, uh, uh, we're glad to have them back for their contribution tonight. Uh, a few quick mm -hmm. reminders. The spooky season is kicking off, folks. Fall is finally coming after this blistering hot summer. If you haven't already, <laughs> get over to AstonishingLegends.com and check out Blogstonishing 2023. This is a great tradition. Test started a few years ago where she posts a new blog entry on our website every single day of October based on listener suggestions. Uh, you can make these suggestions on our social media platforms where she's posted a call for entry. So if you have something you'd like to see her dig into, now's the time. Yes, indeed. Since starting our blog, Tess has written, get this, over 500 entries there. That is, <laughs> just blows my mind. Even we haven't read them all. A lot of times we'll pitch something esoteric, like a topic to her, like, hey, what, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, being all proud of the obscurity <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it's like no one's gonna know about this one. Uh, yeah. we, and we, you know, where we plucked it from, and she's like, oh, oh yeah, I did a blog post on that like four years ago. Another thing that's hilarious is when she posts about it and asks people for suggestions, she's just responding to a great many of them with the blog entry she already did on the suggestion. So you got to <laughs> dig deep, people. Right. You got to dig deep here. Get up pretty early in the morning. Yes. Yeah, that's right. All righty then. Do we have any Halloween merch news? Well, I'm still waiting on the final word from our supplier, but we are working on a fun new Halloween merch item for this year. Mm -hmm. One of the most requested ones, but I don't want to say until I'm sure we got the supply chain locked in. So check out the housekeeping section in our next episode, part two here of uh, Truman Bathurum. All righty. Well, let's dive in here. We've got a lot of blathering to get to, and we're so glad and so appreciative to have gotten Rich and Rob to join us tonight for this one. Yeah, Rob is intimidatingly well-read on the UFO UAP phenomena. I call him the uh. historian. And, and then we have Rich, who's been on the writer strike so long, he's been answering the phone when I call him on the first ring. <laughs> That's, yeah, him and your wife, right? Yeah, they're both on strike. It's a thing. But there ain't no oh. podcast strike. So, Sarah, if you would, please roll our discussion with Rich and Rob for this part one on Truman Bathurum. Hey, everybody. We are back with a roundtable that we have not done in a while with our very good friends, Rich Haddam and Rob Christofferson. And tonight's story is the story of uh, Truman Bathurum and his book, Aboard a Flying Saucer, which came out, I think, in 1953. Or four. I'm sure Rob will correct me on that. But anyway, <laughs> oh, Rob, dear. Rich, uh, thanks, guys, for coming back to Astonishing Legends and uh, carrying the heavy load for us. It's been too long. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be back. Rob is here to provide intelligent and deeply thought out commentary, and I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> because you have the book, okay? You have two copies of it. Yeah. No, that is true. You know, for the listeners, this is a book, and I received a signed first edition of this book from Scott and Forrest for my birthday a couple of years ago. Some of you who follow me on Twitter know about this. Of course, you already had a copy. There isn't a book that Rich didn't have. In fact, he brought books with him that were pretty cool. You have to mention those. Uh, but I delivered this book to him a year and a half, two years after his birthday, because it's so hard to get a hold of the great Richard <laughs> Adam. He's either off being uh, he's with Orfeo Angelucci, <laughs> flying through the stars, or Truman Bathurum here, our, our guest topic for tonight. No, we had a good time. We had a terrific time. It's just very hard for us to both uh, link up. And I'm, I'm so glad we did, because the whole evening was about books, terrific conversation, and uh, little bendy aliens that they put in our cocktails. <laughs> uh, the cocktail, Rich, remember, that was called the <laughs> Alien Pool Party. I know. How weird is it that we went to a place that had alien-themed cocktails and they gave us little alien toys that... Wait, where were you? We were at the Raymond in South Pasadena. The first time we all ever got together and we had a, a big roundtable meeting. That's right. See, there you go. It's all circling back. The idea, though, is that Scott had a great idea to get him this gift of a vintage UFO contactee theme book and... We're going to talk about tonight the differences between these various trends and movements, because something that Rob has elucidated us on is that it is so rich, the entire history of from the 40s to the 50s, and of course, pre-Columbian, you could say, in, in a sense mm -hmm. that the ideas and forms of contact and the the reporting before, let's say, 1947, that watershed year, is so different in the terms that they used, but now we're seeing in the in the 40s and in another watershed year, 1952, 
which is uh, figures prominently in all of this, it, it starts to lay out a rich tapestry of characters and competing metaphysical ideas and concepts and movements and the, the desert. It's a very rich history that I think a lot of people either don't know about or they gloss over it because it's also a silly time. But within it are some very serious concepts that now sometimes don't seem all that serious from the revelations that people are making on social media and the news sites and the, the congressional hearings even. And it's going to get a lot more weird and some things that people had scoffed about in the past may not be so scoffable. So anyway, just quickly to wrap up, Rich received this book about a year later on his birthday for a dinner that I, I finally wrapped and we got a hold of, of a date that we could both attend. And, uh, and, and that was Scott's idea. And it was a year late. And then he said, oh, yeah, I already have this book. Yeah. And we also we did the Christmas cocktail book. I think we had two years before we get the Halloween spooky cocktails. I think we had that two oh, years yeah. before we gave that to Rich. Look, there's no such thing as too late <laughs> when it comes to giving me a first edition or a book of cocktail recipes. It's always right on time. Whenever your birthday <laughs> comes up, we just go to a yard sale, buy a book, and then we sign it and uh, send it to you and pretend <laughs> that it's a first edition. Yes, but see, now you see the mistake in that, because if I already have a signed first edition, I can compare the <laughs> That's two. That's right. <laughs> and then I will know your plan. We have this, this book, which is a kind of a piece of history, and I wanted to make some connections also. We had a lot of fun talking about Orfeo Angelucci previously, and that was Rich's idea, because that was a book we never heard of. And another contactee story that is has a lot of parallels, a lot of different things, but enough similar things that you you do start to scratch your head. It's like, what's going on in this in the 50s here? What's in the water that these people are conjuring up these kinds of things? Yeah, that's a connection. And I think doing the research on this uh, simultaneously while Rob was digging into it was a thing that helped me understand how much this is at the origin point for UFO culture and contactee culture. Mm -hmm. These books are early on, and a lot of you folks probably have never heard of A Board of Flying Saucer by Truman Bathurum, and I hadn't heard of it either. It was actually one of our listeners and a friend of mine, Matt Drew, who brought it to my attention because he found it at some little bookstore in Greensboro. He was like, hey, will you want this? I was like, oh, yeah, definitely. Rob, I know we've talked about it, but what would you say is the difference between an abductee and a contactee? Because we're talking about contactees, mm -hmm. but a lot of us come from the 80s and beyond when it's mostly abductees, like Whitley Strieber and Terry Lovelace, maybe. But what's the difference? Contactee, abductee? I think the main difference between contactees and abductees, uh, for contactees, they generally had contact with human appearing aliens. It was never generally against their will, although, you know, sometimes in some cases it it wasn't, but it seemed like a more of a, a less traumatic experience than an abductee who is taken against their will. Uh, most of the time, there are a few cases that make you wonder, kind of like uh, Herbert Shermer, because Herbert Shermer kind of went of his own free will, but it's considered an abduction case. It's not considered a contactee case. But I think the main thing, and sometimes there is crossover here, is like, from the contactees, what you get is almost UFO religion, whereas abductees, you don't see that as much. And that's one thing that uh, if you read the books these days, they make a distinction between two different types of contactees. There's physical contactees, the people that had physical contact with actual physical beings, and then there are non-physical, the psychic people who channeled messages from other people. John Keel's silent contactees, those were channelers. They didn't have physical visitations from people. But now is that line blurry, Rob, with like, are, are there folks that may have thought they were having physical contact, and, and then, but a lot of it was happening in their mind and they weren't aware? I think there are some in the non-physical category, because some of them do claim, yeah, I have had contact with physical beings, but it's kind of pretty straight down the middle when you think of it. And in the non-physical contactees are not ones that you often think about during this time period, because there is like this dividing line between the two. And not to mention that the physical ones kind of become more famous than the other ones. Like the non-physical, the psych the people that have these psychic contacts, like really become a lot more religious in the way that they disseminate their information. There's a lot more of a religious movement built around it, whereas 
the ones that have physical contact, they kind of have like fan clubs, you know, like uh, good old fashioned <laughs> flying saucer clubs. It's built around stuff like that. And some are more successful than others. Truman had one and a few others did too. Buck Nelson, who is um, a less well-known contactee, but he's an interesting one from Missouri. It's not just all in your head, although you could argue if, you're, mm-hmm. if you don't have any witnesses, like some of these, a lot of these cases, this could all be in your head, but there's a physical oh, aspect yeah. of this. And it's interesting how that cues, how the rest of the public and even fans and, and naysayers view it. In this album, we're seeing it now. Like I've I've been saying this, uh, my theory for a long time now is that you have physical object people. It's like okay, that I can get behind because it's just a thing flying around. It's it's an amazing thing, but it's just a thing flying around. Well, there's nobody in them. It's like well, now if you accept that somebody's flying it, that's a whole other level. If you accept that you're interacting with whoever's in or flying these things, mm-hmm. that's another level. And I believe probably the ultimate level here that we're all aiming towards is the idea of the psychic the psi, the consciousness aspect of the phenomenon mm. in general. And that's where my head was going reading this book, is that the, the last destination, the, the last stop on the, the wild, wacky train ride is consciousness and the soul and being. Let's talk about what happened to Truman a little bit. Rob, you had said that you'd worked up a timeline of events, but mm-hmm. one of the things that I loved about the book was the background on Mr. Bethurum, uh, what kind of person he was. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that plays into understanding the big picture. This was a working class stiff. He's working, uh, uh, building tunnels and roads and asphalt factories and plants and fixes trucks. And uh, he he had to, I, you know, as a kind of a motorhead myself, he was like, I had to go out and somewhere in the book, he was like, I needed to go out and replace all the thermoids. And I was like, what the the hell is a thermoid and i had to look it up yeah it sounded like something from star trek i was like that's not a real word but that was a brand of rubber hoses like gates rubber hoses or what are rubber belts on it so when i looked it up i was like oh he's changing belts and hoses on these you know caterpillar d8s and all this stuff so it's a guy that's working with heavy equipment that's his job Mm -hmm. anyway so i thought that was interesting changing all the thermoids he's doing this work and he starts out in different locations as forrest alluded to earlier he was in santa barbara which he actually really enjoyed because it's a beautiful place and then uh a friend of his calls him and says hey why don't you come out to the burning hot desert i need you now (laughs) and hung up on him before he could say no and showed up the next morning and picked him up and that's the one witness he has which i want to talk about later uh that seemed to have seen a few of the things that happened but uh, and then he winds up riding out to Mormon Mesa out in the desert and and working there at an asphalt plant where they were, I guess, making asphalt so well that they caught up with the road builders and had to stop because the road builders couldn't use it fast enough. So mm. also, he is a machinery engineer and also a supervisor. So before you get the idea that, you know, he's some lunkhead uh, grease monkey. Yes, he could. Uh, he had a lot of skills in repairing and fixing, but he was also a batch plant manager. Uh, mm-hmm. meaning he oversaw concrete operations, the mix. He's in charge of a lot of people. He only had a few people above him. So this book is fairly well written. I don't know who edited the book for him, uh, if it was somebody from the publisher, but... He had a ghostwriter. Yeah, because it, it's it's in the language of the 50s. You can kind of uh, laugh about that, which is, uh, it's a little antiquated, of course, nowadays. But it's fairly concise. And if mm-hmm. you can get into the stream of the reading, unlike like Scott and I were just talking about covering Van Meter and the language of the early turn of the 20th century is a little stilted and and formal. And then you get into the fifties and that's got its own language. Rich and Rob were commenting on it. Was it the Tremonton uh, sighting had uh, an interview with it and just being on camera, the Tremont, the language is Tremont. We talked about this. Yeah. We decided it was Tremont, right? Yeah. I know that that's Tremont. Anyway, so sorry for it. Yeah, Tremont. But getting back to that, I think the the story is, it's a good read. It's fairly well laid out. Same thing I I liked, I appreciated about Orfeo Angelucci. It's somebody who's giving their life story at great risk to their damaged reputation. And I think it's pretty well laid out because one of the most curious things about this is what... Truman's observations of this experience is the people around him, which is pretty typical, which you, exactly what you'd expect, but also what his contactors said to him, his alien contacts and the, the phrases they used were also from the 50s of sorts, but mm-hmm. in a way that he could understand 
that may not make sense to us, but I also found very curious because it's, it's just very puzzling, the answers and the lack of answers they gave him. Well, I think that's typical of all UFO contact. Whenever anybody has contact with any type of being, the answers are always aloof. They are never 100% certain. They'll give you an idea of what their life is like, wherever they come from. And sometimes they take certain, you know, people with them, you know, there's definitely, you know, certain contact stories where you find that. But like, that is the tone of these is all these aliens, doesn't matter what generation you know contact the abductee mm-hmm. straight up contact they're all aloof about where they come from but they'll talk their societies up a lot yeah and especially they do. especially the contactees <laughs> they, <laughs> they do this yeah. book this felt like an enchantment yes almost more than any other book felt like he was being visited by a modern iteration of the fairy realm Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing specific, but did you guys find that? Yeah, I definitely want to talk about the context of it and how it was presented to him. Because if you believe any of this at all, or you believe his story, which we we should get to here shortly, the nature of it and how he perceives it, and the fact that he's not himself wondering why it's being presented in the way it is. But I guess at the time, there's no ontologically, as my brother-in-law with a doctorate mm-hmm. says all the time. And he said, I finally understand that word now, which is, how do we think about this? Yeah, no, it, he, it, he says, uh, he mentions ontology. He did, he, he said it in the book. He mentions ontology. Or maybe his ghostwriter did. That word was in there. And yeah. I was like, oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, working together is a, is a great pair, whether you're Oprah and you have a guest writer. Right. <laughs> whatever your your biography is, it, it's pretty well done. I just want to impress upon that. How do you think about that, this stuff? The other concept before, I think we should have Rob describe his first encounter because that was extremely formative and the way it played out was typical but atypical in a sense we would react differently depending on who we are personally and we would like to think we would act one way until it really happens and then it's like all that goes out the window it's like mike tyson says everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face <laughs> yeah. right. and then that plan goes out the window it's like and this is like a punch to the face but a good one i just want to make clear that he didn't strike me as a really dopey guy yeah he's not Jacques valet he's not a physicist He's not looking at this analytically. He's just a salt of the earth kind of guy. And he even asked his alien visitors, it's like, why pick me? Why don't you folks ever go to world leaders or scientists who can explain this better? You do wonder about that. And who's to say that he just wasn't aware of it, but that's also probably happened as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly that that's also happening. You just don't hear about those. You hear about it from the people who are salt of the earth. It's like, I got to tell people. This is so amazing. And then that's what happened to True here. True is he's called by his friends. Oh, yeah, it's a great nickname. And this is, becomes a more social story of like, what happens when you do that? Well, not a whole lot of good. But in this case, though, it's a story you do wonder, like, well, would you tell anybody? And he felt he had to. And this is what happened. So I just want to make sure that uh, because it was explained to him. And again, it's very, this guy said very vague terms. And as Rob said, you get you don't get many answers, but the answer was like, well, you happen to be in the area, which was good for landing, and and that's why you saw us. And he didn't know, like, well, is that good for you folks, or was that good for me? Because it's an amazing experience, but it really hasn't done much for me on the social level. <laughs> like, people are or flocking around me to celebrate me, at least not everybody, you know, the usual folks. But so, Rob, why don't you, you tell us, like, how did that that first encounter play out? Truman, he gets a call from a guy. His name is E.E. E. Edwards. He's known better as Whitey. Good friend of his. It's the only friend that he has in Las Vegas. So Truman Bathroom goes into people-pleasing mode and goes down to Las Vegas, and he decides to work on his crew. And this is around June of 52. So he's been working there for a while. And... The date of his first encounter is June 27th slash 28th. He's never really too specific about what the actual time is sometimes. But he says this is the day that he became a quote unquote saucer seer. <laughs> More 50s terms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so he's checking on some water trucks and he obtains permission to drive up to this one hillside so that he can kind of look for shells because it's uh, supposedly an area where where the ocean was at one time. So there's a lot of fossil shells around the area. And 
he returns about an hour or two later, unable to, he, he, he didn't come back with any shells and he decides to take a little nap in his truck. And this is a great quote here. Quote, I must've been asleep for an hour when I was startled awake by what I can only describe as mumbling as if by several people and entirely unintelligible to me, I raised up startled to find my truck surrounded by eight to 10 small sized men. I would say that they were from four feet, eight inches to around five feet tall. End quote. And what happened next? Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> <laughs> There's all, often a nap is involved. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And as we all know, the story of Rip Van Winkle was written in my neck of the woods. So yeah, oh, there we go. So he describes these, figures as fully developed adults just really short and they wore these black billed caps and you know they're all wearing the same uniform which consists of like a cowboy style coat and reflective pants and these figures have an olive complexion to them so when Truman he made a, a move to get a better look one of the figures moved forward and they started to speak to him in some unintelligible language This is my favorite part And after shaking his head no this figure starts to speak you know full English just um And what does he say? Uh crap I don't have it I, I'll down. tell you what he says he says the very first thing he says in English to Truman is you name it Yeah <laughs> You name it. No, I just love that. It's just like, first they're like, he doesn't understand it. The thing comes in and he's like, I don't understand you. And then it just goes, you name it. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. My my thinking on that <laughs> is that what Truman also describes is that they seem to be like the phenomenon at Skinwalker mm. Ranch and the trickster and blah, 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 everywhere else. They're a step ahead of you, always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not a psychic thing, because I've come to believe like, well, I've heard also some folks, if you believe that out there who've studied this or uh, viewed them, let's say, believe that there are some who are not psychic at all, have less psychic ability than humans. They apparently don't need it. There are some that are more psychic than us. This case here, he describes them as knowing what they're about to say before he says it or having answers ready to go before he asks them. But he doesn't mm. really describe it as telepathy. Now, I don't know if he's no, this is aware talking. of that or if, yeah. he, if he's thought of that. But they're just, it's just like they're, they're one second ahead of him. Yeah. It's like it's not really, it's a form of psychic ability. You know what saves me a lot of time? Me not texting you links for articles and videos and then pestering you to look at them? <laughs> Well, yeah, th that too, oh, but okay. I'm actually talking about giving a boost to your nutrition, oh. your busy schedule, as well as your taste buds with America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, Factor. Oh. We don't have to grocery shop, chop, cook, or clean up. We just eat chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals that are delivered straight to our door from Factor. Everybody wins. Yeah, Factor is certainly a win-win for me when it comes to taste and convenience. I'm sure everyone can already feel their schedules are getting jam-packed as we head towards fall. Uh, you know, kids are already back in school. Uh, maybe the fam wants to pack in one last trip for summer. Halloween and the holidays will be here before you know it. So whatever is jam-packing your days and schedule, let Factor help out with delicious, fresh, never-frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Then you can get back to business. I just love that I get a restaurant-quality meal in a couple of minutes, and I don't have to sacrifice the nutritional quality I need to get it. Seriously, I was impressed with the creamy pesto pork chop I had, because you know that especially cuts of meat never recover from being frozen. Oh, that one was delicious. I had that one too. And and they certainly do not no. come back from being frozen. Uh, you get a ton of variety with Factor 2. Choose from over 34 weekly flavor-packed options with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Mm. There are gourmet plus options and calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Or try their protein plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Yum. And you know, Factor is perfect for taking to the office when you thought you'd be too busy to even think about lunch with their lunch to go. These are effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat when you're on the go, and you don't even need a microwave with those. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. 
Ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash AL50 and use code AL50 to get 50% off. That's code AL50, five zero, at factormeals.com slash AL50 to get 50% off. How many true crime fans have we got here? You mean like on this stream yard call? Well, uh, I do like the genre, so I'm one. Uh, and don't you and your wife fall asleep to true crime podcasts? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, don't ask. <laughs> oh. But yes, we're fans. We're oh. also fans of a true crime podcast that we wouldn't dare try and sleep through because it's so riveting. It's called What Makes a Killer. It's from Audio Boom Studios and Woodcut Media, and it's in its fifth season. Ah, uh, yes. Well, season five of What Makes a Killer analyzes the lives of Son of Sam David Berkowitz, whose case I've mentioned on air and was already fascinated with. But they also dig into the story of Carol Cott, known as the Vampire of Krakow, and plus other spine tinglers. Now, I wasn't familiar with this case, but What Makes a Killer fleshed out the chilling details concisely and masterfully. I often say the most dangerous monsters are humans, and Carol Cott proves the point. Here's a young guy from a decent, typical family, except that he's a narcissistic psychopath with a penchant for arson, poison, stabbing, and has a blood fetish. But he's not insane. Ooh. You wonder, though, because he was proud to admit that he licked his knife after his attacks. Hence the vampire moniker. You know, boy next door kind of story. Uh, wow. Yeah, thanks. It, not falling asleep to that one either. Mm. <laughs> what I can tell you is that What Makes a Killer is the true crime podcast that explores some of the most twisted minds behind the most notorious crimes. And the audio production is top notch. Totally yes. professional audio, documentary style. By interviewing detectives, family members, forensic experts, and even some of the survivors, What Makes a Killer will give insights into the events that turn these people into cold-blooded killers. Yes, you know, the main question everyone wants to know is why. Well, we may never get a definitive answer to that, but what sets this podcast apart is what you just said. Unless you talk to the people involved and the experts who analyze the cases, you won't get any closer to that answer. Well, if you like to sometimes put on your criminal psychologist, profiler, or detective cap, this is the podcast for you. Hosted by Jennifer Natoso, each episode explores an individual case, examining the motives, the methods, and the aftermath. And you can binge the first four seasons right now on your favorite podcast app. If true crime is your jam, you must check this out. New episodes drop every Thursday. Follow What Makes a Killer on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Hi, this is Kirk, and when I'm not having my memories erased by aliens, I listen to, um, what was it again? Um, anyway, let's get back to the show. Oh, it's Astonishing Legend! And the very next thing, immediately, after you name it, the very next thing is let the bragging begin, because there's a lot of utopian talk in this, as as we mm -hmm. learned from the research, most of which Rob directed me to. But what the very next thing is, we have no difficulty with any language. It's like, oh, oh okay, good. But now, if I had been there, I would have been like, I don't know if the first thing I was saying was you name it. I don't know. You might be having a little bit of difficulty with your first English thing that you said to me, but that's okay. We'll, 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 look, we'll look past that right now, as opposed to hello or do not be afraid. But it's an answer to the question. It's like, well, what language can you speak or what language would I understand you or do you know English? And they're like, you name it. We know them yeah. all. Yeah. And well, so where go. else did we see? Where, where, do you, yeah. where do you see this cockiness? 2109, vertical plane, anyone? Yeah. It's just like, we're like we have no answers to your mathematical questions before. It's like, okay, just shut up. Just get the, stop with the grandstanding here. I got to say, one of my favorite things, and you will read this time and time again of accounts of alien encounters, is that these aliens will always kind of crap talk what humans are capable of. <laughs> right. Like every, yeah. every single town. And, and like some of them are like, oh, humans, you and your primitive ways. <laughs> Hey, I do that now. You know? <laughs> like, like, yeah. So he steps he steps down from his truck. He feels a little calmer about the whole situation because they can speak English. And he sees a huge flying saucer. Quote, in size, it was a great circular monster. It looked as if it were made of burnished stainless steel, measured about 300 feet in diameter and six yards deep in the center. A three-foot metal rim with beveled edges, a foot thick surrounded the saucer-like ship. This rim was about two feet thick in appearance. 
I saw nothing else, no wings, nothing else at all. It seemed to be hovering several feet above the burnt out scrubby brush of the desert mesa, end quote. So he sees this huge ship and, you know, after a brief exchange, uh, one of the beings, there's this one kind of leader being among these 10 and he kind of like grabs him by the arm and escorts him forward towards the ship. And he's, going to introduce Truman to the leader of this vessel, the captain. And he goes and he meets this woman. She is a little shorter than these other beings. I think she's like four foot five. But needless to say, he is enamored with her. She's got hair that goes down to about her shoulders. It's like black hair. She also has kind of an olive complexion similar to the other beings. And she's wearing this like black velvet top and skirt. So very red pleated skirt. Yes, red pleated. So it's and very... a jaunty beret, if I yes, remember. Yes. And a very nice beret. There's a bow on the on the black velvety short sleeve blouse. So again, very much clothing that he would be able to identify with. I find that interesting. And also the guys, as he said, wore uniforms as, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the the company uh, that he likened them to, just like workmen's overalls. No accoutrements on them. And I was disappointed. No shiny belt that had a, a laser or uh, things hanging off. He said no belt, no belt at all. He was surprised at that. Uh, they had no work, because he's wearing a workman's belt, I'm sure, a tool belt. But they had very little on there. But again, it's nothing so weird, nothing shiny, gray. Uh, it's just very common clothes. And she's dressed in maybe what a, uh, like a wa- women's Air Corps outfit would be from World War II, which was what he would be familiar with. And at this time, for people to know in context, is that the younger fellas, they would have been uh, involved in the Korean War. So that would have been going on at this point. Truman himself had worked for the war effort quite a bit. He knew a lot about aircraft and machinery, so he has good knowledge of this, and he was amazed by this thing, mostly the saucer, I think mostly, being a mechanical-minded person and just how it flew, so he had a lot of questions about that. There's a couple of points, even later, where he definitely enamored with her, but then he'll go, there's something weird and almost mask-like about her face, yeah. almost like it's made of marble, And every once in a while, he becomes aware of it. And then he kind of forgets about it. But you do get the unsettling feeling that they're not showing him their true selves. Okay, yes. And to that point, again, before I forget, jumping ahead a little bit here, she also uh, has a lot of emotional IQ on him for the most part, as much as he claims. And again, he's these are all his thoughts. And he's taking notes and remembers very carefully, apparently, what she said to him and how she reacted. So that's very detailed in the in the descriptions in the book. And in this one encounter, she kind of notices that he's yeah enamored, but yeah, you, okay, who wouldn't be? As he says in the book, like, what guy wouldn't be freaked out and amazed and wonder and awe of meeting somebody aboard a spaceship, especially a, a not totally human looking, but an attractive being, which may be part of the purpose, but it's more Star Trek in, uh, <laughs> in, its, yeah. in its weird attractiveness. So she says, well, why don't you come up and, and you can touch me? And you can see that I'm a real person. I'm, I'm not a hallucination because, of course, at first, he's also going through the same natural reactions most people would. It's like, am I hallucinating all this? Have I just passed out in the desert sun and I'm dying and this is like my last Twilight Zone memory and I wake up and it's Rod Serling smoking a cigarette standing over me? Or is yeah. this really happening? Is this physical? That's what I got from this. And she says, you can come over and touch me. So he comes over and he puts both hands on her shoulders And she says something very curious. She says, please use restraint, else you might guess something which really isn't so. And is like, are you going to feel like, oh, that's a gear. Like, I feel wires under there. Or like, what did she mean by like, don't, and I don't think it was sexual. I don't think it was like, you know, hey, stop with the groping, buddy. I think it was, if you press down too hard or you, you're going to feel something like it's going to give you a wrong impression of what I am not. And it's like, you know, yeah. is it going to be Total Recall and uh, Quato is in her stomach? Like, what's going on underneath the black velvet blouse of her uh, service uniform? Yeah. One of the first things that he asks her is, where are you from? And she has a very, again, convoluted kind of uh, response, which is, quote, our homes are our castles in a faraway land. So 
it does feel very fayish in that way. Like mm-hmm. uh, again, you know, I'm, were... I'm not fully aligned with the mastery of English, but okay, we'll go. We'll go. Yeah. With it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. the, the other thing, the, the, well, talking about uh, fairy tales and the fae, what he describes as how her voice sounds is it's higher pitched than normal, but pleasing. He comes to like it, but he says that she speaks in a sing song rhythmic way in that you would tell a mother goose tale to a child. So there's yep. a there's a lilting fairy tale quality to it, apropos to what Scott's saying and what Rich is saying and and the and Robin or so is myself. Uh, so we're all agreement. There's there's something that is dreamy fairy tale in experience with this, and he's describing her voice that way. Yeah. The other guys, uh, the little guys, they speak pretty plainly. They they wave hello, you know, like they say hi, they wave. They don't have a whole lot to say, and that might be part of their. Uh, their duty uh, roster there of like what not to say to this guy, what you can say, because her her speech is very controlled. But he he finds it pleasing, but it is different. Harkening back to Rich's Mothman little quip there, it's just like, well, it's it's outside of the human vocal range, but you can understand it. You know the recordings of it's yeah. it's just like uh, yeah, sharp struck. It's like yeah, that's not really a human voice. So it's kind of little what he's describing here is something it's unworld otherworldly in a way. Yeah, I just assume that she's like Tom Bombadil and she's just like, you know, like laying down riffs, you know, from Lord of the Rings because Tom <laughs> Bombadil just like, he doesn't talk. He just sings everything. Like, so yeah, that's just the vibe I'm getting. The the fact that that some of what she says comes across in kind of a broken rhyme scheme, yeah. again, feels like an enchantment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Truman sits down on this like leather... Uh, upholstered divan kind of thing <laughs> it's it's yeah, yeah that's the best way that he could describe it and it kind of like it, it kind of sinks down a little bit which uh would probably startle me too but they kind of engage in this like <laughs> q a which is what most of their exchanges become like truman comes aboard the ship talks to this woman and learns a little bit more about their culture so uh the first thing that he learns is that they do have a supreme deity, so they worship God, basically. Time and distance is no concern for them. Their ship is called an Admiral Scow, or a Scow, which is, if you think about it in terms of a ship, it's kind of like a, not like a really small dinghy, but like something a little bit bigger. It's a, it's a small ship. Yes, and they're and from a maritime tradition, scows are flat bottom, so they can go lots yeah. of places. Like they don't have to worry about yeah. draft. Yeah, she describes other ships, quote, ones with hooks and grotesque tails, being quote from someone who wants in the news. So like, she describes these like there are good beings out there, and then there are other beings out there who just want the publicity, basically. So they have these weird looking ships that have, you know, these like weird tails and they got hooks coming from them and <laughs> stuff like that, which is interesting. Yeah. But eventually she receives the signal and she escorts Truman out. There's like a time limit here. And I think it's usually around, I think they have, they have, like people scout it very well or they have it uh, time to when it seems like the sun is going to come up kind of, it kind of varies uh, eventually just returns out to the ship and they go along their merry way and thus ends the first visit. In the split second before it disappears from page 47, from my view, I could see that there were no propellers, no exhaust vents, wings, rudders, or other outside extensions. The outside was smooth and symmetrical. There was no noise of any kind at the takeoff. It left there with no time for me to take a good look or guess about anything quicker than you could bat an eye. It had disappeared and left not even a vapor trail. Rob, where does Truman fall on the chronology of contactees? Is he an early one or a late one? He's very early. In fact, uh, many consider him to be the second. Adamski's story first appeared in Fate magazine in 1951. This is a year later. And his story starts to become more well-known in 53. And later on, Adamski is like, hey, welcome to the party, pal. Yeah. (laughs) Basically, yeah. He, yeah. Adamski will play a a small role in the story and how his story kind of gets out there. Yeah. He is widely considered the second contactee. 
So what's interesting to me about this one in particular, and at the end of this, this is one of the few times that, that we have an eyewitness is this first one, because, or supposedly, because yeah. Whitey, his friend who got him to come work in Vegas, is like, what, I saw a plane, or what happened out there? Yeah. What, what, I saw something coming down. So he's saying he saw something. Now, keeping in mind that Whitey's perspective is only presented in Truman's book. So mm -hmm. I don't know, and you have to tell me, Rob, but like, I don't know of anywhere else that his friend is interviewed about witnessing anything that Truman experienced. Do you? There is not. No, there isn't. And I think the funny thing about this book is right up front, Truman just starts to present a bunch of character witnesses for him that will yeah. vouch for him. Yeah. And one of them, he includes a letter from his union rep. I think it's the treasurer mm -hmm. of his union. And yes. saying like, oh, Truman, he's a trustworthy guy. You know, I could count on him for anything. So like, yeah, literally in that, uh, I think it's like the prologue. It goes through a bunch yeah. of names of a bunch of different people that he trusts. And then he includes that letter. <laughs> but it's a little strange that you have to assume these are, were people that at that moment when the book was published, people knew who they were. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, we know who oh. Truman is. We know all the people he's mentioning. If a newspaper reporter wanted to, they could go look these people up. Business mm -hmm. names are mentioned. Location specific addresses where he lives. There's a ton of information here that could be followed up on. And I don't know if anyone did. Right. I, I think it was a different time and place to do that. Not like now where then you have somebody show up on your doorstep and stab you 25 times. The, he did, he mentions the brothers who started the Perkins restaurant chain. Yeah. That's the one I, yes. I grew up with. It's like, I know that restaurant. Yeah. They're still I around. Have They're like, you know, 15 states. I didn't remember that when I read the book. And I was wondering why the Perkins link was in our outline from you, Forrest. I was like, what the hell is Perkins well, yeah. doing here? Yeah. <laughs> because I, I, we've had many a family meal. They make terrific pies. <laughs> it's a little like Baker's Square. It's like, if you know any of those chains it's like he knew those guys and right. I, I gotta say it's a little like getting to the characterization i mean this truman fellow the Thurum, is like a guy my grandfather would have at least known or been friends with and that is my bias here yeah. in that i don't know what to make of this all of this i think there is something genuine about these descriptions perhaps something fantastical, but not to his fault, but he is such a real character, which is what I got from this. Now there's the era of, in the, in the early 50, 1952 and, and to 54, the era of the four Georges of contactees, which is a weird thing in and itself. There's the four main guys <laughs> yeah. named George. The yeah. Four well, Georges Adomsky, of the apocalypse. Van Tassel, King. Uh, Van Tassel. No, we got uh, George Williamson, George Hunt yeah, Williamson, right. George, George Adamski, Williamson. George King, mm -hmm. George King, and George Van Tassel. Oh, see, I don't know yeah. Georges. Yeah. George King is a British, he's a British contact. Oh, okay, okay. But, gotcha. but, but to just to drop anchor once again, mm. quite often <laughs> now you will get stories of the, you know, supernatural, and, and they'll say, look, right. we're not using real names. Mm -hmm. We're not going to name check people, you know, to protect their right. privacy. This guy spills it. He's naming people, naming yes. places. And Orfeo oh. Angelucci did the exact same thing. He said, I work yes. at Lockheed right off the five freeway in Burbank. Right. And here's 12 of my friends who were with me that night when I called them out and said, hey, look yeah. in the sky. And they will all, if you talk to them, they will all say... And look, I mean, again, I'm, I'm so curious because I know that this was newsworthy stuff and there were maybe not the New York Times, but there were newspapers that were covering this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it feels like it would have been easy to go check up on this with those yeah. actual human beings. Exactly. I think that is a point and a practice. It's something I noticed in the book uh, or taken from the Mayfair lectures of Dr. Alexander Cannon. And he claims that he was, uh, you know, this guy was head of the, uh, I think, the London Phys Society of Physicists. You know, he's no slouch. Certainly was taken very seriously, but he gave a, a couple of lectures and demonstrations, and he claims that he was, uh, I believe, on a got on a trek with a friend in in Tibet, and they came across a, uh, I guess you would call this a, a an ascended one, a fakir, a swami, on the side of the road, and this guy performed amazing feats, and one of them was that he said, "Do you have a friend in like a foreign land, perhaps London, England?" Well, yes, of course, yes, we do. He said, mm -hmm. "Okay, I'm going to a port." an item from his office just to show you that, you know, what I'm talking about here is real. And he's like, okay, let's see this. And he produced a painting from this guy's office. And he, you know, brought it out from under, and they're like, what the hell? 
uh, aside from pulling materializing fruit for them to eat out of the air, and this would be the uh, mid, early to mid 30s, I think, is that he said, okay, you have to, I can give you this painting, but it's like, this has to be returned by midnight. That's what the uh, the wise man said. Is it, why midnight? What's going on there? What's that little rule? He said, well, let me put the painting back. And uh, I think it went away or they, uh, I don't remember if he gave it to them and it just disappeared. But they get back to England finally and they go to London and they, and they look up this guy, this other guy. And, and this is also a uh, an administrative guy. I can't remember if he was a, a physician or administrator of some kind or or somebody in the government. But it's like, hey, did anything weird happen on this day to you? Did you notice anything? He said, yeah, the like, painting in my office was gone for a day. And he said, I could see where the, where the you know, the outline where the painting was. And then it's like, well, that's weird. Somebody nicked the painting. And then he comes back the next day and it's back. And they're like, okay, yeah, because this guy here the, by the side of the road said he, we saw the painting. And he said, okay, that's pretty freaky. But the point is that in his book, Dr. Cannon says, if you don't believe me, you can write this guy. Here is his address. Here is his office. Here's his daytime office hours. Go ahead and write him and see what he has to say. And I think a few people used to do that because, again, they wouldn't show up and, and try to, you know, break into your underwear drawer. You know, it's like it just people had a little more respect. There was a little more of like, well, that's a curious old story, old chap. Let me, let me see if that's true. And you would you could contact. There's a civility there, not like today. That is something that that goes back into the roots of theosophy. Helena Blavatsky was said to have done tricks like that, but she also met these people that she called she would call them Mahatmas. Yeah, they would call them masters. They would later become called ascended masters. That's not a term that she used, but it's a term that mm -hmm. came through theosophy later on. And in her mind, these were people that through knowledge and wisdom found a way to extend their life. They weren't like, you know, some like non-physical beings or something like that. These were legitimate people that she had met or supposedly had even dreamt of at uh, points in her life and that uh, she would come up time and time again. But yeah, that was one of the things that she had the ability to do was like, it was almost like performing magic tricks and making things appear like that. So like, yeah. And that's definitely part of like ufology going forward is like when you read the old reports and stuff like that, you will see like, I'm pretty sure John Luttrell, when he wrote the article in the Boston traveler about Betty and Barney Hill, he literally put their addresses in the article. Mm -hmm. So like, that was just a thing. It's and one of those doxed. things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, like doxing people was just like a regular thing, but it also it's that epistolary nature of these of these things and these reports. Yeah. In this yeah. book, Truman says, I was staying at a trailer court in Santa Barbara at like 4150 something road. Yeah. So I just picked up my phone, Hollister. typed it into my search. It's still a trailer park. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this place actually exists. Yeah. And there are still trailers parked in that little spot. I'm like, it is 2023, and he's talking about 1952. Yeah. And it's like, well, that checks out. That so checks far, out. Truman, you're yeah. a true man. <laughs> well, it's, it's sorry, but on the opposite, it doesn't matter because they get on the opposite of that. You get people say like, well, this is all made up. These, these aren't these aren't the real names of people. How do we know that it, it, this exists? It's like, well, we're trying to predict their identity. Like, oh, how convenient. You don't want to list the names of real people. It's like we're getting that now with the congressional hearings. Like, well, who do you talk to? How come you're not doxing them? I don't know if these are real people. It's like, yeah, that's for security purposes. And so people don't harass them, which is, is much easier to do nowadays. And so here, uh, like I said, in, in a kinder, gentler time, perhaps, it's like, well, yeah, these people are real. This is a real story. This really happened to me. Here's You can go talk to Whitey. He's a nice fella. and yeah. uh, But nobody did. That's what Rich is saying. Why didn't anybody go? Well, well, well we don't we don't know. We don't know if, uh, you know, I well, truly don't Rob know if anybody said he ever reached hadn't out. hadn't seen it anywhere, right? No interviews with Edwards anywhere. That's also the thing, too, is if you're going to find interviews, you're going to find them in newspapers, and those aren't always the easiest to track down. Like, yeah. Truman's story was first published in Redondo Beach's uh, newspaper. I forget what it was called, yeah. but mm -hmm. right, that's where it first appeared. And But I don't think with most journalists they wanted to go find out if these people were real or something like that it, it wasn't like yeah I, I don't 
think it was like that for journalists at that time. I don't think they were trying to get to the nitty gritty of like, oh, these people are grifting people because they already believed that they were grifters and that right. they were just there's no point to it. To people. Yeah, and to an extent, that's what they did. They did get money out of people because they went, they lectured, they shared their stories all over yeah. the country. So automatically, you're going to have that on your back. I don't necessarily see that as an entry or, or a barrier right. to belief, but you know, who doesn't well, profit off their story these days anyway? Well, yeah, somebody's got to, unless, and then you get blamed if you if you do it all. It's like, well, hey, look, making these flyers and on the mimeograph and stapling that you know, that cost me two hundred dollars. Like, yeah, well, you made some money, didn't you? It's like, well, I'm not gonna, I can't afford all this. You're not gonna pay for your own money. When you think of the guys like. Joe Simonton, he made a pamphlet, the Falcon Lake incident, Stephen Or Feo Angelucci did back to him. He made a little yeah. booklet. You got to make a booklet. Got to make a pamphlet. Yeah. And then he wrote on and went on to write two books. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Ray. Now back to the show. Okay, so moving moving on though, mm-hmm. this is a very curious thing about this uh, the story and the way, and I can understand both sides to this, but he did something that is good and bad for his personal life, and that he's so excited he has to tell somebody, and the first person is his immediate supervisor and friend Whitey, who kind of <laughs> talked him into the job so quickly he didn't have a chance to say no on the phone, and I know what that's like. Is that uh, you're doing this, right? Okay, see you, see you at 11. You're still mad at me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I find curious is that Whitey, very excitedly that morning, and, and at this time to, to be clear that uh, Truman has the night shift, the graveyard shift. So he starts at 4 p.m. and he's checking on the water trucks and the maintenance that has to happen overnight before the, the morning shift arrives for the water truck drivers and everything's ready to go for their shift. So this is it's a, it's a 24-hour round-the-clock operation. And so he's got the night shift, which allows him uh, some little bit of peace and quiet. And he, he still has a supervisor, but that's how he got out there in the first place. He, you know, he asked permission, like, hey, can I go uh, check this out? And so he's got a shed out to himself that uh, is pretty rudimentary, but he comes back to the main shop. And why he's very excited. He's like, hey, did you did you see that thing land out, out in the desert, like, early this morning? I mean, was that a plane out of fuel? Was it a commercial flight? Was it a private plane? Was it one of the, yeah. the uh, Wells Cargo? That was the operation, uh, which I've still seen the trucks around here. They're still in operation. Scott can speak to that in a second. They're still around. It's a real place. And the guy says, is that one of the brothers with his private plane? What landed out there? Did you see that? And at first he's like, smartly, he's like, no, I didn't, I didn't see anything. I, uh, what are you talking about? I didn't see anything out there. And the guy goes, come on, I, I saw something out there. You must have seen it. You were right there. And he's now, now, now. And, no, he I, I and then he's like, right. "Oh, I, I, okay, I can't keep this. I can't keep this a secret." Oh man, I was a UFO. UFO. I was on a UFO. There was a hot yeah, captain. Was, <laughs> there was yeah. a. Hot, and then this is the flip side: is that and this is why this story is also interesting to me: is that it's a panoply of human psychology and behavior and reaction because it's just like I saw something amazing in there. Wait, not that. I didn't see that. Like, were you nut? Yeah. Are you nuts? That's crazy. Okay, a commercial airliner, sure, taking a, a, a fuel pit stop and out in the middle of the desert, that's one thing. Uh, because he also, for him to describe that size, it was enormous. So first, Truman's thinking, again, rather naively, but, you know, this guy's his longtime friend. He's like, well, he'll believe me because he saw something. So I know this is crazy, but if he saw something out there that seems impossible, then what's the next logical step to tell him that, yeah, that was a flying saucer, which Whitey's like, okay, yeah, dude, you've, no. <laughs> I don't I don't know about that. Yeah. And so he's rather incredulous, but he but he becomes slowly more of his ally than the other guys working for him, which is just it's just a panoply of ridicule and rolling their eyes and nudging and, and goofy questions. And then other people thinking like this guy's stay away from him. He's nuts. Or he might be working with the North Koreans and the communists. And if we see him again, but we catch you out there again talking, to, uh, having intercourse. Uh, that's another old timey phrase, folks. Right. Yes, that's well, for talking to each you other. Know, <laughs> yes. I mean, engaging, interacting with people. We're going to yeah. shoot you and those commies. And he's like, okay, this is turning dark. Not to rush us through this, but there is a moment where Whitey does get involved. I don't know if we want to go there. I'm sure we'll get to all the other stuff. We'll sort of backfill all. Yeah. The well, we've got we got eleven encounters here. We've done one. So yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we can we can breeze through these other ones. Well, should we talk about the one that happens at the diner? Yeah, that said, I was teeing it up for Rob. To yeah, like carry let's it put through. let's that put was, Rob back in the driver's seat here. He's he's quicker. Yeah, than we that are. was. I just want to let you know yeah. that of course he tells people he expects that reaction and he wasn't hoping for, but that is the reaction of uh, it is ridicule and. Now he's got to wear this albatross around his neck, but it doesn't stop them from having sightings, of course. And he's, they told him they would be back. Yep. The captain says like, well, just think about a time and a place and we'll be there. So obviously they're reading his mind from far away from out, from outer space. So that 4D theory. It's the, uh, you just yeah. think about it and we'll be able to see it. So uh, the next thing uh, happens, of course, and there's more discourse, but again, he's kind of leaned into it at this point. And yeah. now it's like, I'm the, I'm the crazy saucer guy. Kind of like I'm the crazy plain lady. Pretty much. Like at a certain point, he's shameless about it. He doesn't care because like, you know, as someone firmly in their beliefs, firmly in this idea that, hey, I've had these contacts. There, he doesn't have any shame. There's a level of innocence that comes with the way in which he talks about these encounters with his co-workers who, you know, ridicule him to a certain point. I mean, even Whitey, it's kind of a laughing matter for him. But seemingly after this, he tells everybody in the vicinity, everybody that he interacts with practically about these UFO encounters. And the second one takes place about a week later. It's August uh, 4th. And... He's replacing some seals on a water truck and he ends up following one back. And in the course of doing that, he sees this one streak of light come out of the sky. He assumes it's a meter at first and then he notices that there's a color change to it. So he follows Highway 91 out to this one area and there's the UFO. There's a few of the short beings out there and they escort him on board. And of course, he meets with the woman again. And the first thing that she notes is that he's gotten fatter. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, she says something like, your work must be good. You know, you're looking. For yeah. Or I don't yeah. know. Was it uh, Thanksgiving? Thou, What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Thou canst yeah. afford good food. Uh, my, my Zion. Exactly. So, yeah, it's uh, but he's he looks healthy, though, that which is good, which is an odd also yeah. an odd staying because is she expecting him to have gotten sick from the encounter? Like, oh, you look a little gaunt and peaked there. Right. Yeah, you kind of you kind of have to wonder. But so she employs this tactic where if she's asked a question, doesn't want to answer it, she just ignores it. That is a skill I want to master. Me too, sir. I That's yeah. exactly what I thought. You just smile, you smirk, and you move on. You could probably catch people off guard with that. I'm going to work on that after we're done <laughs> recording this episode. But All right, you, um, and me, you and me both. Okay. He asks her about the troubles, quote unquote, of her world. And she states, quote, the things that trouble and worry you earth people in our homes, you'll never find. We know nothing of illness, doctors or nurses. You have mechanics and laborers, too. In our land, they only mean trouble. So you see, they are all taboo, end quote. So as idealized as a society as this is, it seems dystopian on top of this utopia. Like, it seems a little more dystopian at times. And she talks about how, if she wanted to, she could buy her own plane on Earth. She could buy, like, her own military and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of funny, the observations that she mm. makes. yeah. But she would give it back. Yeah, she said she I could buy all of this, oh, yeah. but I would give it back to you. Again, I, maybe you know we're also putting a, a, a human spin on uh, on their thought processes. Maybe they uh, they obviously have a sense of humor. They're a lot like us in certain ways as she compares to, but they may not think a joke that you think is funny may not fly in uh, yeah. another part of the the world here. You know, it's like no, we yeah. don't joke about that. You freak. <laughs> So there's a little bit of disconnect here on the cultures, I think. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that he remarks on is atomic power and how we're basically trying to use it for good. And she says, quote, that's a step in the right direction, but a very short one. End quote. <laughs> it's, just <laughs> like, it's just like these odd little remarks that she makes. She notes that politics and taxes are bad. And before she lets him off the ship, she lets slip. And I don't even know if she meant to, but maybe she did, that she comes from a world called Clarion. And 
they have no troubles there. The The greatest problem that they have had to solve is to how to control magnetic forces in order to get their UFOs to fly. That's it. Yeah. So no problems there. And he leaves the ship. He has another odd encounter like he has a lot of odd encounters with whitey after every single one because he kind of eggs him on every single time and, and he's like oh have you seen that ufo again did you, did you talk to that woman again and there is this through line that starts to show up where truman keeps trying to get his wife to come up here and she wants nothing to do with it and like this is a dude that needs to learn what boundaries are because like <laughs> Just like he keeps trying and writing these letters and she gets more and more concerned over time. Yeah. But, uh, she refuses to come up there one because it's Las Vegas and it's hot as hell. And two, she's watching her granddaughter. Yeah. And some of the some weird kids. Kids I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> so August 18th rolls around. We get our third trip on board the UFO and he starts to describe what he calls becoming sky conscious, meaning that he just kind of notices when these ships like fall out of the sky, basically. I love that term. I, I feel like I'm sky conscious. Yeah, I think um, I think we all are here. Yeah. To a certain, <laughs> yeah. To a certain extent. I, I, I agree with that. I like to think I'm sky curious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. on this trip, he's got a bunch of questions with them. And he just puts them in his back pocket and he totally forgets about them. Right. <laughs> but one question that he asks is what her name is. And it took him three trips to ask her that. But uh, her name is Aura Rains. Aura, like an aura. And then Rains, not like it's raining outside, but R-H-A-N-E-S. Yes. Yeah. A-U-R-A. Yeah, exactly. Right. Very, again, very metaphysical. Yeah. And I don't recall her spelling it for him or him indicating that she spelled it for him. Yeah, she did. Oh, she, she did. did. Okay, she okay. did. Okay, yes. good. I just want yeah, to make sure. Yeah, he asked her to write it out uh, because he yeah. intended to uh, relay this. And he, here's the thing. It's like, it wasn't until the second, maybe third trip where he finally, maybe the third trip uh, visitation where he's like, maybe I should uh, start writing stuff down and bring a camera. Yeah. And right. try to get to get a little yeah. ahead of here, but like no recording devices, not that that would matter. And of course you find out there are a lot of other elements to this story that are <laughs> one of our favorite tropes, uh, Michigan J frog. Oh, apparently mm. there's some writing, uh, Rich is holding up the, uh, the book and there is some writing. Oh, that's right. Her. She signed a piece of paper. That's right. Because some, there were questions. Which is submitted. Chinese. Yeah. But that doesn't yeah, have her last she, name there. It doesn't have her last name, but yeah, <laughs> right. she spells it out. And uh, like I said, it, it is very 50 sci-fi. It's very curious, though, that the fir her first name also, as he says, has a metaphysical knack to it or bent. And mm. that's what he says, uh, as Scott mentioned earlier, that what Truman says in the in the prologue is that you're going to have to think about this with a metaphysical and ontological eye, is that this is really brings into question not just physical craft and is there seams and rivets and how do you, how's your engines work? Or she says, you know, to, it blew his mind that there was no reciprocating engine on board. She told him it's all control of, uh, well, gravity engines is and, and electromagnetic forces, which fits in with the narrative today that we're hearing about. And what he's saying is that uh, it's all a very metaphysical experience in a way. And like her name, which is, again, it's like a sci-fi character and not even, yeah. <laughs> not even a believable sci-fi it's not Klaus Niktu Baratu, or I can't remember the I can't remember the, the guy's name from the days the years stood still, uh, but Klaus it's like Barata Niktu. That's what he there says. Yeah, that's the that's the yeah. phrase. It's yeah. like when people think of sci-fi, and it's in very human terms. And even our art today, I just thought about this. There's a there's an ad on I think it's Netflix or uh, no Apple TV, and it's about an alien invasion and us battling aliens and monsters and and uh, they're, they're squid-like kind of things. And that's the way Hollywood thinks. It's not a quiet revolution within of your mental and psychic powers and, and mind control. It's things that we have to shoot. We have to do battle with the boss battle, with just like 15 aliens glued together. And when does that happen in the, in the fourth act? The spaceships look very Star Wars. It's very put together. They're not, mm. they're not orbs inside a transparent cube flying around or vice versa. It's not these things that are beyond conceptually things we like to think about. They're very concrete, and we tend to think about these things in the same way. And this is what I'm getting at, is that, that this is how Truman is approaching this. It's very much a 50 sci-fi humanist angle. It's not so weird that he can't understand it, although he may get vague answers. 
it's a very tangible. And I do wonder if that was purposely made that way for him and his experience. The word clarion means brilliant and clear. Mm -hmm. And most of us know it from the term clarion call, which mm -hmm. dates back to the Middle Ages and refers to a trumpet call. And all of this stuff begins to sound real, very, very sort of based in folklore, almost biblical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you're talking about science fiction, yeah, like with science fiction, it's part science, but it's also where your imagination leads you. And in these kind of stories, the imagination isn't running completely wild. This is all grounded in, in like everything that uh, one is, is occurring in UFO culture, but like two kind of has a little science to back it up a little bit, not right. in any great length, but there is a certain level of perceived logic, maybe not 100% the logic that we would think of, but like there's a definite logic to these kind of encounters to a certain extent. But like, you know, Truman's is a little bit different because like there are oddities in this case, especially like the beings and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's pretty logical in, in a lot of ways. Except for some of her descriptions about the way cosmology works. <laughs> and that, and mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get ahead, but just to put that so we don't forget to talk about it. Uh, her descriptions of what it's like on Mars or how yeah. her planet's not visible from Earth. Okay, Rob, you mentioned that the book was ghostwritten. And... I'm just wondering if you have more information on that, because we're getting into words, we're getting into phrases mm -hmm. and the way various characters speak. Yeah. And when I'm hearing all this, I'm wondering to what extent can we view this as more or less a document from something he did or thinks he experienced, or is it heavily ghostwritten? I mean, I don't know. So Aaron Gullius, he's the host of The Saucer Life, which is a great podcast. Mm -hmm. And he wrote mm -hmm. a book. It's called Extraterrestrials in the American Zeitgeist, which is about like the contactee movement. And one of the things that he brings up in there is, quote, one of the critical issues which arises in discussing Bethram's work is the question of authorship. Often, as in the case of George Adamski, the question of whether or not a particular contactee personally wrote his own books, magazines, newsletters, or other materials is shrouded in mystery, accusation, denial, and counter accusation. Contrary to this approach, Truman Bethram was open, at least in private correspondence, about hiring a ghostwriter to compose aboard a flying saucer. In a letter to saucer publisher Gray Barker dated November 16, 1953, before the publication of Aboard a Flying Saucer, Bethram discussed his motivations for creating the book. Quote, I found that many people whom I have told of my wonderful friends from space were using my words in their speaking engagements, etc. So I finally decided to do something myself and have my experiences written in book form by a fine writer. It is now in the hands of publishers for consideration. I hope it will be published soon, for it will be a revelation. Additionally, in a letter later to Barker, after the book's publication, Bethram mentions, quote, I still have my original notes I gave to Miss Tennyson that did my ghosting and asked Barker, please remember, I am not a professional, which he spells wrong. He spells it P-R-O-F-F-E-S-I-O-N-A-L. <laughs> writer. That's not, that's not how it's spelled? Okay. No, it's not. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. All right. I, you doubting me, Burgess? I'll, I'll, I'll from, I did, no, just that it's it's amazing that it's it was written by the granddaughter, or the great great granddaughter of Alfred Lord Tennyson. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I, that, 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 I don't know if that's true. But hey, we got a that name. Be, At least we got cool. a name. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Miss yeah. Tennyson, by the way. I just wrote down the conversation and what happened and a few of my own conclusions. This candid discussion in his book's authorship leads us to the question of the role. The author, in this case, Bathroom, played in understanding contacting narratives. Mm. But the impression I get is that, from what you just read, Rob, is that he had an experience, he made some notes, he found someone, he spoke to that person, and that person more or less wrote what he said. Like, there was some communication between the two of them that he signed off on. Yeah, exactly. He didn't not agree to what was published. Right. Or he didn't die. And then now we don't know right. because then, you know, a year later mm -hmm. a book comes out and it's like, no, he was there. And he said, 
I went, I found someone, I started talking about my experiences Then I heard, and I went to a convention and this is all at the very end of the book. He does mention that he became a bit more open about this. And then he heard that other people were telling his story. Yeah. And he's like, wait a second, this is my story. And right. this was his reaction was like, people told him, well, you better get a book out there. And so he's like, so I did. And you're <laughs> yeah. reading it. You're holding it. You just finished it. Yeah. There's a book that was published in 57 called Flying Saucer Pilgrimage by mm. Bryant and Helen Reeve. And they were in the Detroit area when contactees were starting to become famous. That's one of the places that they went to. And that's kind of where the contactee thing blew up is like going to all of these like talks in just um, coincidence. That was our first public appearance, me and Forrest, Detroit. You're, you're following in their footsteps. Yeah, exactly. Again, it lays out to a large degree how these things played out in the 1950s. And Rob later on may talk about basically the cult-like aspect, which is a little different here is that I don't think he's, and this is, again, I, I tend to trust his relaying of this because I, I see this with others and you guys can, can speak to this as well, but there's oftentimes I get very uh, suspicious, skeptical when somebody says, I have more answers and if you hang around mm -hmm. me, I will. Uh, I'm I'm the one receiving the answers, and I will lay I will relay them to you. Send four ninety five mm -hmm. plus shipping and handling to my post office box, and you'll get the uh, the monthly newsletter. Yeah. And I certainly would have paid for those albums that Roger Patterson was making uh, about Bigfoot sounds. And I, my right. God, I wish I had one of those. <laughs> uh, I would gladly have sent away for that in the back of a comic book. But what we have here is, I think Truman is saying, "This is it. That's the story." And uh, thanks. And I might be right. speaking here, but I'm kind of done. And not to jump ahead, but he does leave a portion of his story kind of unanswered, as it were. Mm -hmm. In other words, this book begs for a sequel. Yeah. Where yeah, it's it like, oh, the continuing adventures. Hey, it wasn't the end. <laughs> right. And things got even like the thing that was promised me actually happened. Yeah. We'll get to that. But but again, it's I like what you bring up, Forrest, the notion of, well, how far is this guy going mm -hmm. trying to get us all to believe? Mm -hmm. Right. And we talked about it with Orfeo Angelucci yes. and how yeah. contactees who actually provided less physical evidence are more believable. The ones that suddenly have, oh, and I forgot I took yeah. a picture and look <laughs> well, at it. That's... You're like, like you I say, once you start up far. a compound and then uh, with Billy, it's, I got I got pictures like that's a pretty good. I think you can get that with a lens, baby. It's a type of a device. Uh, Once you need all of your female followers to bury your children, I got a problem. Hey, okay, now now you've reached a point that's where I point. take some contention, sir. I have a, 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 a small group, and you <laughs> oh, leave God. them out of this. Okay, we're doing just fine. Now here, the, um, but, oh, but, I but speaking, yesterday. but no, speaking. To, okay, just quickly, I want to say the that just speaking stands. to this point where all, like I always say about these stories, it's most of it for me is how people react to this stuff because I don't know what you know, you know, the captain, the lady captain. To if you make it up the story, like okay, I'll give you points for that. Uh, you know, lady captain of a spaceship in charge of a bunch of dudes. That's pretty uh, forward thinking, there, sir. And, and again, I don't know if he's making that up. I don't know if he thought it'd be more believable because it's like, well, that's, that's unbelievable, which is now suddenly, ironically, more believable in this crazy story. Or, you know, again, if he's making that up, but like he just thought it would be a good sci-fi fiction angle, or if it's true what their society is like, <clears throat> it's a weirdly progressive for a, a 1950s story. The super skeptic will say, well, this, is, this guy's a genius. Well, that's what I'm saying. He, he's, he's spending a night in the desert meeting up with some woman. Right. And he comes up with a cover story where that actually allows him to beg his wife to come to where he well, is and meet her, and yeah. the wife refuses. Okay, <laughs> that's where I'm going with this, or that was going to be my next suggestion. By the way, the drawing uh, that I saw, uh, she reminds me a little bit of, if she were uh, dark-haired, a little bit of uh, Faye Dunaway in mm. Bonnie and Clyde with the beret and the straight hair and just kind of the eyes. Uh, so, and she was, yeah, just a gorgeous, uh, terrific, wonderful actress from uh, the seventies and certainly that movie. And she was all the heyday. So a little bit before, of course, this era here, but I do wonder about elements that have taken, were taken from popular culture perhaps, or informed his imagination. But to that point, Rich, is that, okay, so in how people react to this, He's got to tell somebody, and he already knows how that goes. It's not; it doesn't go well. And and Whitey's kind of on board, 
but he's he's having trouble getting on board with his friend who you know maybe this as he says maybe they she would think that the nevada sun has finally baked my noodle and i've gone insane and he writes a very very long letter explaining everything finally to his wife it's like well she's not coming anyways might as well just spill the beans and plus i gotta tell somebody she's got to believe me and the way that mm. she reacts is he said well i did not good yeah <laughs> like but what was i expecting and imagine telling somebody especially back then uh, people who haven't heard, you know, you, you read stories in the magazines and the and the papers, and everybody, most everybody's ridiculed about this, as Rob was saying, and especially the government's coming out saying, well, none of this is real. These people are wacko. Uh, right. And so that's her attitude. It's like, none of this could possibly be real. Why are you telling me this? This is scary to me. Stop it. In fact, I don't want to go out to Nevada, but like, especially, you know, I hope you keep writing to me. And I hope you keep, uh, you know, telling me that you miss me, but like, stop with the saucer talk. Like you're freaking me out. Seriously. What I love about this, and this also speaks to the type of people we are and uh, the, our collective of kind weirdos, uh, is that the wife is very genuinely concerned about his mental being. And so she, he talks to his daughters from a previous marriage. The current wife is named Mary. This is for his previous uh, wife uh, that he's married to. He's got two grown daughters. And the current second wife, Mary, contacts them and says, like, hey, was, his dad, was he ever committed? <laughs> was he ever, did he ever freak out, talk about weird stuff? <laughs> and they're like, no. And, and so she explains the whole saucer thing, thinking like, okay, finally, I'm going to have some allies on my side, some advocates to maybe get him some mental health that he needs. And they delightfully say, like, oh, my God, that is a fantastic story. What else did he say? <laughs> they are on board with dad. I love that aspect. Classic like, dad. Classic yeah. dad. It's like, Sounds okay, we got, like you, you got to get him to tell us more of this story because here is Truman's point about that. They grew up with me. My wife, she's known me maybe at most eight years and doesn't maybe, you know, maybe this is an aspect of my life that like, she said, <laughs> maybe he was crazy before. I don't know. And now his daughters are behind him. It's just like, yeah, get dad to tell more of this story. This is fantastic. Yeah. He, he's really torn about this. Some people believe him. Some don't. His wife, you know, he's who he loves, currently just not on board at all. Literally, <laughs> literally no. or figuratively, not on board with the saucer stuff. So in this case, the person that you trust most in the world or should is your your spouse, is the person who believes you the least. Well, at least, like he says with his coworkers, some of them were trying to were threatening to kill him, <laughs> and, then, and around the yeah. same time, it was like he's getting the wide range of reactions. As Rich was previously talking about, the other commonality that I see that I can't imagine Truman, unless he's a freaking genius, picked up on from other literature and and documentation was the coloration of the skin as being olive or a little dark. So that also fits with Indrid Cold on the streets. He's like, he's a little dark complected. Also, the beings from the Cisco Grove incident as being dark complected with uh, big round flashlight eyes. And also it, Joe Simonton. Yes, Joe Simonton. So uh, it's nice to see some, <laughs> see your, to see myself out there and represented uh, as, as an olive skinned individual. There, there's, there's some representation, I guess. But th that's another weird thing, though. There are some interesting elements if you just want to read this book as science fiction. And that once again described, I've heard this before, is that as he describes the interior of the ship, he said it's very bright, very well lit, but I did not see any light source. It's not like there's mm -hmm. overhead fluorescence flickering. Super common. Super yeah. yes. common. All right. So now, Rob, what have we touched on? Three of our 11 encounters? We're just about done with the third here. Like, yeah, he learns her name, basically, or Reigns, and kind of learns how, like, she, again, she kind of has a snooty way of talking mm. about Earth. It just seems like we're below every other alien civilization out there. And in this one, you know, she really talks about how other planets aren't like us. They don't have the yeah. problems that we do. And, you know, she eventually dismisses him. Well, well, first of all, we're, we're, we're stinky, smelly apes. The other thing I thought is this guy just worked a whole night shift sweating in the hot desert heat, which I've done, by the way. I've worked at several at corporate events, uh, like for Toyota, mm. out in the Las Vegas heat. And you're dusty, you're sweaty, you're probably dehydrated. You look like a an evaporative salt marsh. And that's yeah. when he goes in to meet uh, this very alluring uh, lady from another planet. And it's like he's sitting down on her couch, probably he's got butt sweat stains on it. I, well, who knows what's going on? And I don't, I don't know if we had to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're okay with that? All right. <laughs> 
He's sitting down on her never ending couch and he sinks way into it. It bounces back, back up and he has a little giggle. And it's like, that's how he's presenting himself. It's like, <laughs> look, yes, I've worked many grimy manual labor jobs. And, you know, the, just the, the thought of like him stinking up her office with the BO. I think of these things, the actual realities, the, the physicalities of this. And that's how he's being presented as the human race. Certainly, she said before, it's like, well, we've we've landed in many places on your lovely planet, and uh, we're in control yeah. of it all. And, uh, you know, so they must have met other folks. But but that's if I were Truman, I'd, I'd kind of want to freshen up a little. Yeah. But he he doesn't. He's just he's just there. He's raw. That's how he's uh, representing the human beings in, in this part of the world. Yeah. The, after this trip in the saucer, he gets the idea, I'm going to start writing questions down to ask her because it's just like, I get on there and I, I, I get certain things to ask. So he, he collects questions from a bunch of uh, people he knows, including Whitey. And like, there's this diner that he eats at. So he asks the waitress there to think of a question. She writes one down in French of all things. And Truman doesn't know French. So, you know, this is the ultimate sign, the ultimate test that if she knows <laughs> yeah. all languages, well, she'll be able to write it. So his fourth contact. According to the book. Yes. yes. Sorry. No, no. Yeah. Well, it's all according to the book. Unless you can find that waitress in the diner, which uh, Scott and I just. Right. That's my point. We just came yeah. back. Yeah, they could uh, be making all these people up. Right. Yeah. But it's, again, these are. These there are, is a Chinese note in the book. Yeah, we'll get to that. These are, yeah, these are real places. And as Rob described us, it also speaks to what Rich is saying. It's, it's a very dreamlike quality of several campfire stories from Jim Harold's Campfire podcast have reminded me of this, where I just read a story from a listener today that was emailed to us where you're mistaken for somebody or somebody does not, again, it's quite a trope where you go up to somebody like, don't I know you? And like, no, mm -hmm. we've never met. And where has that happened before? It also reminded me of Jack Nicholson with Grady in the bathroom at the Overlook Hotel. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, I've always been his. It's like, aren't you Grady the caretaker? And it's the mistaken identity. Did you which... murder your family? <laughs> you uh, have always been the caretaker. So yeah. that's a, it's just a weird, dreamy experience here. But this time, Whitey's with him. Yeah. He's convincing his boss at this point to stay up with him most nights. Well, he does for one of them, and... He misses the entire thing. Uh, so the yeah. UFO lands and <laughs> he left for like 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Didn't he? Didn't he? He like went away and that's exactly when it arrived. Yes. Convenient. True was hinting that the, the night was hot and the beer was cold. And I, yeah. they, I think Whitey's like, I'm just going to finish the six pack here uh, while I'm on yeah. break. But it, again, it's, it, it's, it's kind of always say it's a Michigan J frog thing. You're trying to get somebody to look. They don't show up. Oh, they just arrived when the guy was supposed to be here. Yeah. And nobody yeah. sees this thing. And that's, of course, what we got going on here. I'm Kira Barsotti, and I love to listen to Astonishing Legends while I paint space girls in the Southwest. Let's get back to the show. So he's sitting in his truck, and he hears a rapping, and he hears the voice of Aura Rain say, Hello, you know we're here. So he gets out, goes on the ship, and he starts talking. He learns that Clarion's on the other side of the moon. The scientists of Earth are terrible, according to her. There's people on Mars. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, like, Bethlehem is so entranced that he's got these questions, and he just stashes them in his back pocket. Doesn't, doesn't end up asking him on this one. But uh, he wants to take her picture. He has a camera with him. And she says, quote, I think not, she said, after a long, suspenseful moment. A picture wouldn't do you any good anyway. I know you want one to show your friends, but what would it show, after all? Merely a woman in a room, a picture which would not prove anything, end quote. Still. She is well, correct. She's got a point. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she's got a point. Yeah, but we're friends now. Come on. I just want to I want to get a selfie with us yeah. uh, together, which I'm going to post uh, nowhere because there's no internet. But yeah. but it's just the fact that she she says that and his attitude's like I I okay okay yeah I know but how about just a picture just something you know like a, a memento, and that's yes. also something that uh, it, it is funny that is a critique of Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson he you know I remember he, jokingly and he's he's kind of funny I, I enjoy his his quips and he was saying like look if you've been aboard a flying saucer bring something back like an ashtray just grab something from the office it's like yeah. here's she has an office here and it reminded me also a little bit of uh, the submarine docked next to the Queen Mary down in Long Beach 
the Foxtrot class sub, where you see the captain's quarters and it has a long red leatherette bench. At least this is a, a, a sub of Russian making uh, back in the day, but like it kind of reminded me just like that, except her office is roomy and it's this thing is kind of huge. And he saw there were lights where something was going on in the background, which were no dividers, but he said there was some activity. It is kind of that weird thing like the the Twin Peaks Red Room where there's something going on behind the curtain and he's not quite sure, but he never gets a chance to ask, as Rob was saying, is that, you know, when in this spectacular, fantastical environment, all your logic and questions go out the window and you don't behave normally. Finally, now at least Whitey's there because the other reaction from people, uh, his coworker, he said, look, I'll pay you. I'll pay you your, your, your overtime wages if you just come out with me and just look at this thing. And I don't know if it's paranormal apathy, but it's more like, no way, dude, we are not going out with you to see something that's going to blow our minds. No, thank yeah. you. I don't care how much you pay us. Because he was like, I'll just, I'll pay your overtime. Just come out with me. No one would do that. Except for Whitey will finally say like, well, okay, well, I'll go look at the ship, but I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> Which I thought, I thought was really funny. Yeah. After she says no to a photograph, he asks, can I take a, a picture of the flying saucer? And she has the most mom response ever. And she says, well, perhaps sometime, <laughs> not tonight. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, um, you know. Which means no, ever. Yeah, yeah. basically. All, all the time. Like, that's the code language. Um, so after, you know, getting out of the ship this time, she basically tells him that you could lift this saucer yourself. It's not that heavy. So he does. He lifts it up a little bit. Realizes it's this Go incredibly ahead and try. light. Yeah. So. He, he does that and then ends his night there, eventually goes back to his hotel room. And the following day, he notices he's, he's with Whitey in this restaurant in Glendale, Nevada. It's about 3.30 in the morning, and they notice Oral Reigns and one of the men sitting at this counter, just like eating and... Whitey wanted nothing to do with it. He was freaked out. So he goes outside. He's like, you know what? If I see him coming out, I'll, I'll tell you where they go. <laughs> so whether this is like Truman Bethram going up to a couple of people and annoying the hell out of them because they don't know him or it really was Aura Reigns. She's like wearing sunglasses, apparently, and goes over and, and she's like, hey, don't I know you? And she's like, no, no, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Very quietly, and, like, no, no. Yeah, no. exactly. Every every question, no. Right. It's like, yep. hey, don't talk to me here. I told you never to acknowledge me in public. <laughs> but yep. it is that weird thing. I mean, there's there's a lot of stories about people seeing aliens posing as human. I mean, Whitley they Street literally did an episode one. about it. Yeah. yeah. But they always have this feeling where it's like, it's like you begin to notice there's something different about these people and they're dressed mm -hmm. a little different and they're wearing right. dark glasses indoors in a dark, you know, and then you try to approach them, but they, they say something weird and then they disappear. So this presupposes that trope because that's mm -hmm. exactly yeah. how this feels. Yeah. Well, it's um, also a, a lot like the MIBs, how they're described either in two ways. And we started hearing this uh, from Albert K. Bender 1952 describing the men in black and that i think the two main descriptions is that they're either like reanimated cadavers very pale and waxy looking and and half dead or they're robotic you know this guy's there's wires hanging out of their their hat and they don't know how to cut a steak and also the, but the, there's something again very dreamlike about this and it reminded me as well as richard gear at the motel at what three in the morning rich you know where he's just look at the map like this is impossible this is that the whole scene of just like, I love to watch that movie late at night because there's something very evocative about that. It's that yeah. another time again, when the Fae and everything, the veil is thin, that things are happening and it's mm. not a thing to be seen in bright daylight. This is a thing to be seen in desert moonlight at an evocative yeah. cafe out in the middle of the desert. Very Lynch like David Lynch like, yeah. It is. And we get excited because we're like, oh, this is like, this is it. This is proof. It's like, they're right here. Right. And then, of course, Rob, what's the twist ending to this ep episode? Uh, so, you know, Whitey's outside. He's waiting for him to come out. And these folks pay their bill and they leave. And he says, I never saw them come out. So, bam, right. there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I just saw in watching an old John Lear being interviewed by oh God. Uh, George Lear. Knapp <laughs> is that he's talking about captured aliens yeah. and that the government had to put them in something like a Faraday cage. Again, I, I don't know how to believe all this kind of stuff. Who knows? It's Maybe John we'll Lear. Find out that um, exciting or horribly terrifying. That comes with it. What? Well, there. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yes. But the concepts are fun. And like the one I liked is that, yeah, they had to put this uh, little alien man into something like a Faraday cage, an electromagnetic shielded kind of thing, because with their technology, they also had developed telekinetic and psychokinetic psychic ability where they mm. could transport themselves through matter. And if they didn't have this little guy in there, he'd disappear. He'd just, boop, he's gone. Now he's at the beach. Now he's at Redondo Beach having a, a, a fish taco. He mm. could be anywhere. So he wanted to visit the ocean and they had to like, okay, but we got to protect him because he, again, what does that sound like? It's like capturing the leprechaun. It's like, if you don't hold on tight to his little shillelagh, he'll disappear and you don't get the pot of gold. So the idea though, is that here we have, uh, he sees them leave the cafe mm. and his buddy Whitey's smoking a cigarette right outside the door. I said, true, I got to tell you, man, honest, I did not see them leave. No one came out. No. Nope. So, boop, they're gone. But, uh, Rob, what did the uh, the waitress did say to them? It's like, you know, she did say she was very sorry and that, uh, yeah, she said <laughs> she couldn't acknowledge you, but the, uh, the answers to your questions were a lot of them were yes. Yeah. Needless to say, we have another incident of weirdness going on here, and... Truman gets a letter from his wife saying that he ended up talking to uh, his daughters to figure out if he was crazy or not, see if there's any history of that. And turns out he, you know, was on the straight and narrow. And this is where he starts to get death threats, assuming that he was meeting with Soviet agents. And the interesting thing here is four years after he publishes a board of flying saucer, he does publish another book that is very pro-capitalist, anti-communist. So it's mm. very interesting on that level mm -hmm. because it's not a book about, you know, further contacts with Oral Reigns or anything. It's literally a book about pro-capitalist stuff. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself. But uh, we're getting to the fifth contact. This is September 5th. Do you think as, as a defense to... I, I don't think so at this point. Maybe he was getting death threats, but I doubt it. And, and the thing is, is like... You could say that these guys are promoting communism, but I don't think they are. I don't think any of them really are at this point. And not to mention that, uh, and something that we'll probably talk about later is like a lot of the contactees were in with people who had ties to the Nazi party in the United States. Yeah. So yeah, well, that's a discussion for later on, but like, I don't think any of them are really promoting pro-communist stuff. It just seemed like they were because of like some of the things that they would say. And, and, and I think the pro-communist stuff comes from the fact that they're saying, hey, stop using nuclear weapons. I think that's where most of it comes from. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like mm -hmm. these like idealized societies, they don't make any sense because they're so like ambiguous and there's no real explanation of how any of that works. It's just, hey, this is how we live. And that's not to say that some didn't publish works talking about how these societies kind of function and stuff. But again, I don't think it's all that pro-communist as much as people want to think it is. But yeah, September 5th, 52, Fifth Contact. This is out at Mormon. It's, it's near Mormon Mesa. It's about 10.30 p.m. This is like the earliest one that he's had yet. And this visit was pretty brief, but uh, they talked about Truman's worries about contacting them and how they may be harmed by people. And Aura laughs, and she's like, humans can't do anything to us. Don't even worry about it. Yeah. Uh, we would simply just make them disappear. And to demonstrate this, and and what I love about this is like, it kind of mirrors a men in black encounter. Mm -hmm. So he has a flashlight. She's like, you know, take the flashlight out and holds it in his hands and she makes it disappear. So if, if you're familiar with the Herbert Hopkins men in black encounter, one of the things that the man in black does is said, he tells him exactly how much change he has in his pocket. And he's like, take out a penny. So he takes out a penny puts it in his hands, 
and the man in black makes it disappear. And then he makes a convoluted statement that saying that if he didn't destroy his UFO files, he would make his heart disappear like Barney Hill's heart disappeared. And that's why he died. It's like the most convoluted thing that you've ever heard in your life. But like, it's a cool flashy magic trick, but making something disappear kind of like it sits with him for a while. So the next day, Truman finds that one of his suits is like ruined after he sent it to the laundry. And he comes to think that it's because he lifted up the ship. It was the same suit he was wearing that that same night when he was lifting up the ship. So I was I was uh, disturbed that that came back from the laundry without a note or anything. Like yeah. you would think the, yeah, you would think the dry cleaner or the cleaner would be like, I didn't do this. I don't know what happened yeah. here. Sorry. Here's your pants. Yeah. Uh, there and also, yeah. So there was something of it. It's like you're not going to say anything about that. That this the clothes are right, severely right. damaged and dissolved. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it happened in the bag on the way from the the cleaners uh, to okay. his hands. That's convenient. Yeah. What are you going to say? Yeah. Excuse for everything. Yes. For Scott, this is the most chilling part of the tale. <laughs> Yeah, the, <laughs> it is chilling. Scott was scarred by the uh, the Summerton man's laundry tag incident. <laughs> oh. the, the, the marker. He's never gotten over it. Oh. That's probably the most baffling thing about that entire mystery is that whole exactly. laundry debacle. Because yeah. really <laughs> if, if you could find that out, you'd find it like, oh, yeah, he was here. And, okay, aha. And, and now what? Well, that's all we got. He was just dropped off his laundry here. So, yeah, uh, we didn't. We didn't get a, a snapshot of the guy. His laundry was it, dissolved. Yeah, yes. yeah. I don't. I, you'd think that his friend or a or a Rains, Captain Rains, would have warned him about that. Just to be like, careful when you. When well, you don't care about his clothes. Go ahead and lift it up, but just just be careful. There are cryptic things because he did wonder again. This is after the atomic age or in the golden heart of the atomic age here with everybody. They they're all aware of it. He did wonder, true, did wonder about uh, radioactivity because she did say after his questions, like, "Hey, could I? You know, what if I brought up a, a group of fellas right. just to see this?" Right. And she said, eh, "Probably not a good idea. They could all be. Uh, what did she say burned?" Yeah, I think she, it was. Like that, it yeah. sounded kind of ominous, and he's like, w- "What do you mean, like radioactive burns? Is it because if there's too many people or too many humans, maybe you put a protective electromagnetic uh, sphere around me, and that's keeping the uh, the gamma rays or whatnot uh, away from me? But if there's too many guys out here, you can't do that, and some guys are going to get hurt." And she didn't, of course, answer that. She just has her cryptic as like, "Yeah, not not a bunch of dudes. No, that's <laughs> you know, like." She's got her crew of like 20 or 25 or so, and and that's enough, and that's uh, that's all the male that she wants. 32. She's got 32. Yes, But right. each scow has 32. She's also open to him bringing somebody along. She doesn't put the kibosh on that, so one or two people. It's just that it also seems like maybe she knows that that's not going to happen. No one ever goes. I read this, page 108. I ripped open the package, intending to put the clean clothes away where they belonged. Imagine my surprise and banked-up anger when I saw that my almost new work suit had been ruined. The whole lower left side of the shirt and the rear top of the trousers was gone completely, as if they had been eaten out by acid. Believe me, I was so mad, I planned to tell off that laundry at the first opportunity. (laughs) But suddenly, while holding the ruined garments in my hands, a thought struck me, which cooled my temper and made me think again. This, surely, was the suit I had worn on the night when I had leaned against the rim of the saucer and talked with Clarion's little men. When I had lifted the saucer, I wondered would that have had anything to do with the deterioration of the material. Well, there was no way I could tell, so I might as well give up thinking about it for the present, and I resolved to remember to ask Captain Aura Reigns about it if and when I got another opportunity to talk to her. Yeah. The interesting thing is, is he kind of runs into her on the street. So later that night, he's going over to Whitey's house, going to eat dinner with the family. So he decides to go into town. He's going to get a haircut. He's going to get himself a new suit. And of course, Oral Reigns is out in the street. So he calls to her and she just shakes her head. (laughs) Like, no. (laughs) Is Truman Bathroom just accosting women on the street? I can't. (laughs) <laughs> you know, totally rule that out. But, you know, who knows at this point? Like, well, I'm, because I'm again, not familiar with that reaction from <laughs> several women. Yeah. Just like, no, no, just go away. But like, the thing is, is like, in, in the way this story is written, you can clearly tell and, you know, chalk it up to the ghostwriter. She makes him seem infatuated with her to a certain extent. Yeah. So like, you can't 
like deny that. So he goes out, he has a good meal and, you know, he tries to convince Whitey that his, him and his wife should enjoy, you know, join him for a contact experience. And they're like, no, no, I don't think so. So they're like, is this about Amway? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh God. Yeah. So later that night he drives out to a place called Henderson, which is six miles out of Las Vegas. And he tries to initiate a contact experience using his mind. Um, because in like the previous contact experience that he had told him, Hey, all you have to do is, you know, use your thoughts and we'll show up. So he's in the vicinity, kind of not far from Nellis Air Force Base, and he sees this bluish light heading in its direction, settles over his truck, and it's the scow, and it settles down, and some of the men, they de- he describes them as like tumbling out, which is great, and, uh, you know, stated that Aura wanted to see him, and he was really troubled by the disappearing flashlight situation, and he wants her to explain it to him, and she just kind of like... You know, oh, you humans and your earth ways, you would never understand that kind of, mm. you know, I couldn't give you an explanation in English. Yeah, I mean, because she also had been saying, we don't kill anything. We never kill anyone or anything. Right. We just so he's like, make them disappear. Where did it go then? Is if it's still alive? Like, yeah. Yeah. So what? Not that a flashlight right. can be alive, but that was. You know. It's at the Sally house. Take a drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take a shot. But there's no, there's a lot of, uh, I guess I just want to make this point here in this era of uh, the golden era. Uh, the early 50s, 1952. Scott and uh, Rob had said early on, you're not trying to contact, well, there's another way to co- make contact, and that is not through a radio means, although they've tried that as well, but you have psychic mm-hmm. means. I think a lot, because it's a lot cheaper too. You know, a lot of expensive gear investments to make. It's like uh, George Hunt Williamson, uh, his wife, Betty, they, they meet up with another couple, uh, Alfred Bailey and his wife, also named Betty, and mm. they were trying to use a homemade Ouija board right. with a shot glass as a planchette to contact aliens. And it was, as they call them, the space intelligences. Right. And the couples strike up a friendship. They apparently make uh, contact with, again, very 50s sci-fi names. Uh, some like Zoe of Neptune, Zago of Mars, Na9. Sounds like a rap name. It was Lil Na. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. it's NAH dash nine. I mean, come on. Uh, and but they also try uh, technology, trying Morse code transmissions over shortwave radio. And then uh, Rob will speak to this later. But Williamson starts acting as a channeler or medium because again, yeah. who knows? It's not a radio that's blaring these communications. Is in the um, well, the poor Paul Benowitz is actually getting communications over a radio. You're talking about a medium. It's just like, well, who knows if that's real? It's just what the person is right. telling you that they're receiving through their brain waves. And so, uh, again, it's a lot easier, a lot cheaper. Also, there's a long history of that. John D. Edward Kelly were using it to communicate with angels. How is that any different here? Well, you be the judge. Emanuel Swedenborg. Yeah. It's, it's Swedenborg. It's, the list yeah, a long history on. of this stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not sure I can fault Truman here for making allusions to this. It might be just. I don't know. You know, like I said, osmosis from the uh, from the zeitgeist of uh, sci-fi. <laughs> this time, when Truman is on the ship, he remembers that he has a bunch of letters from people saying, "Hey, respond to us." You know, like, and one of them is French, and she writes in French. So somebody writes it for her. I think she has like on the ship. Truman says that he can hear the sounds of typewriter clacking away. But it's not by Aura Reigns herself. It's by somebody else. In it's one of the room. other guys. Yeah. Yeah. In another room who's taking like dictation. He, he assumes like telepathically or something like that. And he asked for her to write a letter in Chinese. And like, this is where I, I don't know if this is racist or not. So like, you kind of got to bring it up. But like, there's mm. a Chinese cook in yes. the restaurant yeah. and he assumed like, oh, he has to know Chinese, so he'll be able to read it. Mm-hmm. So and she writes in Chinese, quote, Chinese women hold their husbands with love. If not, they put them in chains. Your friend Aura. If you got that in a fortune cookie in the age, I mean it sounds like it's from a <laughs> fortune it cookie. It does. It's just like, wow. Yeah. Or and you will meet a very interesting stranger tonight. Or you're about to go on a on a very adventurous trip. Yeah. Whatever these things are, it's just an odd, again, very odd sayings. 
that I'm not sure if it's uh, lost in translation, as they say, or made up, but just weird. Yeah, curious. Yeah. When you translate uh, but, that um, with Google, that it, it comes back a little bit different. It's a little strange. Okay. It comes back. You can, it doesn't get all the words, but it says it mm -hmm. starts with no dimension. Mm. And then under that, it says, then hold the country. Interesting. No dimension, then hold the country. And then it says add, and there's some characters it couldn't figure out. But it does say lock husband, and it does say mm. your affection or uh, your friend. But uh, these first well, two okay. lines it figured out, no dimension, then hold the country. I thought that was pretty crazy. It's apropos, perhaps. Yeah. 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 I, I will say there is a there is a Mothman connection here, and like she becomes obsessed with a pen, so much so that she has to you know take it basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. kind of reminds of that one figure that came into <laughs> Mary Hire's office and like cackled because he got a pen. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to take this back to my kid. Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's it's the small items that are like uh, really. You, put, you roll this on your lips, and it keeps them fresh and moist. Oh, that's delightful. It is cherry flavored. It's it's, it's the small things that uh, people are uh, that take uh, interest in, which we would uh, from from their world as well. Rob, what do you make of the of the French letter? Because both the Chinese aphorism and the French letter are both essentially about the way women should regard their husbands. It's it's very old fashioned like marital it advice. Is. It's very <laughs> weird. So here's yeah. here's the French letter translated quote, dear Maria, on this planet, exactly as on Earth, human beings are of the same nature and have to confront the same problems as you and I. It seems, however, that civilization, such as we find it on Earth, has brought many misfortunes to men. I'm pretty sure it's more than just men, but you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay. With it for, for now. Certainly. Um, we are Christians here, and on this point, we have not retrogressed, as I see from here, the dreadful paganism which is gnawing at modern countries. Okay. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you come from a country where customs and manners are stricter, and on the other hand, there are in America more liberties and greater licentiousness to which one must adapt oneself. If, on the contrary, either your husband or you do not place yourself on guard against the lures and mirages of attitudes based on negligence and selfishness in your marital relations, it is often difficult to keep the love of a husband who has strayed from the straight path without any apparent cause on your part. Uh, okay. Now, now, keep in mind, both of these things are responses to a question written by a young yeah. woman in yeah, French. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe, the, we don't know, maybe the question had something to do with, well, what are guys like on your problem? <laughs> and, or yeah. are you married? Or yeah. what do the mm -hmm. dudes look like? Or something like that that then brought about a somewhat similar yeah. response that has to do with the way women should regard fidelity it's much more about the way women. Yeah, should be exactly. Out. Which is than the way men. Which is be. yeah, skeevy. It's skeevy. Yeah. But uh, the letter continues. Try then to convince him by your unlimited fealty and your complete devotion, refusing to permit your heart to revolt or to reproach past weaknesses. But above all, learn to place your faith in God and. By Christian effort, which will be an example to him, try to lead him back to a sincere faith or to increase in him the practice of religion. Here, God has saved us from inclemencies and has spared us many social misfortunes. We are not acquainted with divorce, adultery, and infidelity to the dangerous degrees that it exists on the planet Earth. Learn from us about the power such as we have already displayed it. Someday Earth will no longer be what it is if men do not change. They are destroying themselves by inches. From your friend without equal to those on Earth, signed, Madam Or. Madam. Mm. And again, well, like, <laughs> the one point I just want to bring up, again, yeah. this is not pro-communist in any way. You're not going to tell yeah. me that this is pro-communist. Because, yeah. like, yeah. this? No. And again... When you talk about other contactees, they literally talk about Jesus and Muhammad being Venusians. So, like, 
again, I don't see this as a pro-communist movement, and I don't think it ever has been. Orfeo, towards the end of his visitations, he one of the, uh, well, as he claimed, Jesus got down off the cross yeah. and transmogrified into one of his space brethren and, and, and addressed him. And I can't remember, Rich may have a better idea on that or, or could remember better because it was years ago that we covered that, but I can't remember what the what the message was there, but definitely a Judeo-Christian theme for Orfeo, who's, you know, Italian and uh, Italian-American, comes from a Catholic background. It's something that he would yeah. identify with. I thought at the time it was something uh, along the lines of, the Martian Chronicles and uh, Bradbury said, you know, with that one character who is a, a Martian and with a priest who had lost his faith, desperately yearning for an answer and some kind of sign. And he accidentally has a Martian crucified in the church because he just happened to be walking by or he says, you kind of trap me with your, your desperate thoughts here. And uh, this is painful. Stop doing it. Again, being shown something that you want to identify with or wished desperately or hope that it turns out that way, and then it happens. As far as how, what she says, she also says something very earlier uh, earlier in the book about her crew, because Truman asks her about the men who are about just about her height, like four, eight to five, one you know feet tall. And she says, uh, you know, yes, they're all very obedient. No one ever asks for remuneration. Like, they don't ask for pay. They just do it. There's never, I can't do it. <laughs> she, she says it very f curiously. It's like, there's never like, maybe, or maybe later, or I'll I'll, t I'll, have, I'll put that on my to-do list, or mm -hmm. when I get around to it, they just do it. And that's how we operate, and that's why we're successful, is what she's right. getting at. So it's also her description of the men under her control. And maybe she's responding as a woman who has a lot of authority, as they say, agency, the, the popular term these days. Well, this is this is how we we behave and we're we seem to be doing it pretty well. So if you want to follow what our footsteps, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Because everything in their land is thought out long before. They just do it. There's no griping, there's no belly aching. Uh, we don't have all of these petty differences. We don't try to blow each other up. And if you want to conquer the skies and the and the in interstellar travel, then here's how we did it. Yeah, I I didn't like it at all. I I I just yeah, it's just and again, it it reflects the times. It reflects the 1950s yeah. very well, um, which is which is the strange part. Like the really strange part here is like, and and if you want to assume like he's making it all up, that it, it would naturally closely mirror whatever our society looks like and and such and like yeah it's it's christianity was pretty dominant around that time so that just kind of like takes it to an extreme it would seem but it, like that's really from my perspective that's what the view of the 1950s was it's like this perfect household the woman in this relationship is loyal to her husband throughout everything and like yeah, that just makes me, just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another moment later in the book, mm -hmm. since we're on the subject, where she's describing a wedding on a planet. It's a big wedding, but it sounds like all the details sound weirdly recognizable. Yeah, she compares it to a 4th of July celebration. Right, but but in terms of the in terms of who shows up, they give gifts to the bride. The bride is a virgin. She yeah. wears white. Uh, her husband is a sounds like a he's a the son of a plumber or something or he's a young plumber. He's super oh, right. he was yeah. the master but, uh, plumber <laughs> for the planet or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. So I guess the planet. Super Mario. Mario. This is story is Super Mario. It's a yeah. it's a very good, always a well paying job. You always need it, as as my plumber says for my apartment. It's like uh, especially during the economic downturn of twenty ten. Uh, he said, well, I, I mentioned it to him, I was like, well, your business seems to be doing okay. He said, yeah, you know why? Because I don't care if you're out of work, you're not going to be standing around in a foot of your own poop. So no matter where you are, <laughs> you're going to want to take care of that and pay any amount of money to get that taken care of. So here, here it good is. job, no matter what planet you're on. Page 157, the reception was held in the gardens of an ancestral castle with our ocean for a backdrop. The castle is built of the rarest marbles and really exotic woods. The wedding united a lovely maiden and the handsome son of our master plumber. The families and many friends of the bride and groom from the many planets assembled. 
All of their friends of long standing were there to wish happiness to this lovely pair, and everyone mingled around. Many gifts to the bride were presented with pride. They were really the pick of the universe. Some of the gifts, I will admit, you would value it many a crown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a deli meat slicer and a. Uh, <laughs> so, but but then a little later on, she says, once they are married, he yeah. will run his business and she will be. Yeah, she'll yeah. take care of the home. So and again, very traditional it reflects the fifties very well. Mm -hmm. Like that's the way it, yeah. things were. Right. So. so what's happening? So then that my question, you know, not to put the cart before the horse, which we are at, usually in no danger of doing anyway. That oh, the, the cart said all over the place, yeah. and the horse. Oh my god, the, the, the cart in a, was off the, the road. Cart is in a different it. state. Yeah. yeah, the cart's in a different yeah. state, and the horse is running free. Yeah. But my my question is. If all of this, as you said a second ago, Rob, is not being made up or whatever, if there's there's an agenda and maybe Truman's getting his agenda out there, or is it that other thing that we've talked about on the show so many times? It's just like a manipulation of reality that he's experiencing and that it's it's coming from. And then you get into this whole much bigger picture. And I'm not trying to open that can of worms right now if we get into yeah. more of a theoretical discussion. But just the idea of being manipulated, like the vertical plane or the siren call of hungry ghosts or whatever, where you're just getting the information that you can deal with. And not only that, it's designed to manipulate you in a way and maybe also make you look foolish, which is the thing we talked about with uh, Terry Lovelace, who talked about little monkeys coming into his room or how people see things that sound absurd so that when you tell that story... It's not going to be believed. That's a thought I had. I just want to jump in here quickly that like the siren call is that the answers are often not correct, but sincere. Mm. And it's like things don't make sense, especially with her descriptions. It's like, so what's happening here? This is like a dreamlike phantasmagoria of sorts of an experience and not everything is right. And like, if you were to ask her, it's like, well, you know, your planet really can't be always hidden behind the moon because the, the moon's orbiting the earth. And like, do you mean the, you know, it's like, well, that's what I, I didn't mean that. I meant we were from the dark side of the moon. So you'll never see us like, okay, now that makes right. sense. There's some inconsistencies here about basic principles. And if maybe if you were to, to drill down, you had some authority over her or uh, Captain Rains, to say like, well, what do you mean here? That's not exactly right. You know, you you said on Mars people have nice, lovely yards, and and they all everybody's got like five acres of ranch land, and it's very green, and it's a manufacturing planet. Like, yeah, but I I, no, I meant like a million years ago when it had an atmosphere. That's what I meant. It's like, well, you didn't say that. And so, yeah. like Siren Call, it's like, well, what do you mean this is not the same place? It's like, yeah, well, what are you what are you hassling me for about the facts? <laughs> like right. I'm from another realm. Our thinking's different here. And, and yeah, I, I, I screwed up the times and the places, but you're calling me a liar, but you, you, you don't, you can't call me that. You don't know what it's like here. And so I, there's a lot of confusion with that, but maybe it's just because we're looking at it with our 3d minds and their experiences, 4d or 5d. And okay. it's just, it doesn't translate right. Like It's like, it's, it, again, it's a big nightmare dream thing laid over into a conscious experience. And it doesn't make sense. So like, there's one element that I, we can kind of broach here for a second, because this sighting occurred near Nellis Air Force Base. So when it comes to the contactees, you kind of have to look at which ones had either military connections or their incidents occurred near military bases. Like George Van Tassel's occurred on White Sands. So that's interesting. Given that they're promoting traditional values here, one thing that always kicks around in my head, is this like some kind of human agent trying to push an agenda to a mm. certain extent? You can't rule that out. And I know like, you know, the idea of the U.S. having flying saucers that are that they're taking around and parking around and bringing random people is may seem far fetched to people. But you can mess with someone's perception rather easily, uh, especially yeah. with drugs and stuff like that. So you kind of have to take into consideration that there is that angle that we're working with. And I think it's really how like traditional this letter pushes things out and how mm -hmm. what it really promotes is what keeps that in my mind. 
and I'm sure I'm, I'm we're definitely putting the cart way before yeah. the horse, but it's just, I think it's something that people should keep in mind too, because yeah. With, it's it's as a bit of propaganda, maybe Rob, is that what right, you're saying? It's yeah, like, exactly. Cause yeah. like uh, with the abduction of Antonio Villas Boas, for instance, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of similarities between what Truman Bathroom went through and what Antonio Villas Boas did to a certain extent in the fact that their, his abductors were about the same height. Mm-hmm. The woman was shorter and one thing that uh, a guy named Bosco Nedeljkovic came forward years later to a uh, UFO researcher and said that the Antonio Villas Boas abduction was a CIA mm-hmm. operation. It's hard to prove, yeah. but it's mm-hmm. one guy coming forward and saying that. And the thing with Antonio Villas Boas is like there isn't a lot of high strangeness with that case. He's literally dragged on board a UFO. He's rubbed down with these like weird substances and stuff. And his story gets pretty graphic, but like there is nothing in that story that screams high strangeness or really aliens really at any point. So yeah, that's just something to keep in mind too uh, with what's being promoted here. So what, what are the remaining visits do we have like important details to share? Seventh visit. They talk about, Aura talks about a Navy operation that's going on at the time. And if you go and cross check that um, from September 14th to the 25th, or even after that, there's a, an infamous operation called operation main brace. It's a n- joint NATO exercise right. designed to test, you know, the response to like uh, a outbreak of war with the Soviet union And during that joint exercise, there were a couple of UFO incidents reported. One included a USO coming out of the water and flying away. So it's kind of interesting that he mentions that because it is like one of those infamous incidents during 1952. There's a lot of UFO activity in 1952. In fact, if you look at Blue Book's files during that period of time, it has the highest number of unknown cases. It's like over a thousand, isn't entire, it? Something they yeah. investigated fifteen hundred cases, and three hundred and three of them were still unknown by the time they were done. So right, right, right. That accounts for forty three percent of all unknown cases during the entirety of Project Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book. So all three of those, right? And so forty three percent of those happened in nineteen fifty two. Yep. Uh, that seventh visit, eighth visit, uh, is when Oro starts to tell him that uh, he could bring some friends with him. They can go to Clarion and and such. Yeah, um, I, I kept not figuring out why this never worked out. Like it's like bring people, right. bring people, and then no one comes with him to look at it, or they come and they leave for right when it lands. It's like is it is the reason it's not working out because this is all made up, or is there some other reason that it's not working out? Right, because no one ever gets on the ship with him. Yeah, I want to read my favorite quote from this particular chapter. Quote, she seemed to have one pet peeve against our earth, and that was the speculation in real estate. Signs out for sale. Real estate promoters were repulsive to her. She said, if we had them on Clarion, it would soon be of small worth. We'd have mansions and slums as you do. What in the world? Mm. Yeah, I, I was like, okay, all right. That's what you're after? Yeah, and it's because of that that she kind of shows kind of concern about how they contacts with other cultures would go between, you know, Earth and every other planet and such. Um, so ninth visit, she describes the lavish wedding. Tenth visit is when they start to make arrangements for the trip to Clarion. And... She explains that you don't need to bring anything. We will, you know, we've got it covered. You can stay for a week. You can leave whenever you want. But there's a dream team that gets assembled here. And one of them, uh, his name is Father John. And Aura (laughs) says that he'd make a great leader. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, You got Bob, who's a friend from Truman's past. He's a mechanic. You got Hank the Builder, Whitey. And Johnny, who was a smiling Irishman, uh, a yeah. motorman in tunnel construction. And one of the first matters that would be attended to when making it to Clarion, 
square dancing. Got to square dance. That's right. Dance. Square That's, dancing. Yeah. Square dancing, uh, a lot of folk music, also some uh, clogging perhaps and uh, polka. It yeah. <laughs> I'm not being I'm not I'm not being facetious. It's uh, but those are fun dances. If you ever do those in uh, we would do that in uh, grade school. But the idea is again, these are things that we can understand and they sound appealing. All of this sounds appealing. And remind me, I'm sorry, I'm the one who keeps bringing up a lot of pop culture references, but if, you, if you've listened to our show before, you know that's what I do. But it's, it sounds like the, the lyrics to the Genesis song, uh, Keep It Dark, which I actually wanted to get a GoFundMe to raise $200,000 so we could uh, buy the rights to, uh, to use it in the show at some point. <laughs> uh, that never panned out. The money could be better spent elsewhere. But the idea is the same, is that there is somebody who experiences, uh, disappears, for a week or two, goes to, uh, as it's described, I think by Tony Banks, maybe who uh, wrote most of the song or had uh, some input on the uh, the lyrics, that somebody goes to the, fu- this guy goes to the future, this family man, I always thought it was another planet or another dimension, and experiences something wonderful. There's, there is, uh, as it's described, cities of light, uh, no fear of war, mm-hmm. and no one lies. All manner of creatures with happier lives. And he comes back to uh, his reality and no one's going to believe him. And some authorities are saying, you can't tell the truth about this. You must keep it dark. And so he has to make up the story that he was abducted by robbers and uh, they mistaken identity and they found out he had no money and they just let him go. And in this case, the, uh, the main character of the story chooses to stick with that, uh, with that narrative but Truman does not, where he could have just said, uh, dude, I saw no plane landing. Come on, that's silly out in the desert in the middle of the night. What are you, you, what are you on, the, the wacky tabacky? And that would have been the end of it, and we wouldn't have uh, a show here. So yeah. I, I'm glad that somebody's, um, you know, people are, are coming forth, and they feel it's also their duty to do this. But you do wonder what part of this is, uh, is influenced by whom? Or is it just, right. uh, it, just again, all out of his mind of like, this is just a fever dream. He was working all night out in the desert, taking a nap, and uh, maybe it did cook his brain a little bit. But to, I think, being realistic, he wouldn't do it this much. Uh, mm. If he had that kind of uh, dehydrated, uh, overheated uh, heat stroke, uh, he wouldn't have gone back to work. That He would have gone to the hospital. Right. And then maybe he would have hallucinated. And uh, And this is, as he says, a pipe dream. But people do weird things. Yeah. Uh, who was the, the construction guy? Uh, I'm trying to think of his name, who went around with, um, you know, before Roger Patterson running around construction equipment with big wooden feet. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, yes. Uh, I'm trying to think of his, his last name, but and his family said, oh, yeah, he thought that was funny. You know, he'd run around with these carved wooden Bigfoot feet and uh, he'd come back to the work next to like, oh, my goodness, fellas, look at this. And uh, they'd all, you know, freak out. That doesn't mean to say that there weren't real Bigfoot tracks going on, because I I think that's also possible. But people do weird things. And it's like, I can't put it out of my realm of possibility that this is all made up. It's just a very weird thing to do for somebody who was never, as he was described by his contemporaries and friends, not really a jokester, like a foreman Jerry, <laughs> like yeah. up there in Northern California. Like, yeah, he's prone to pranks. Like, or as, as Rich said, classic Truman making crap up. Look at him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but who's, whose narrative is this? That's what I want to know. Where's it coming from? So the next night, he's eight miles away from the job site. He sees the scow drop a package. So he goes and picks it up, and it's two flares, of all things. And it explains how to use them. Now, he's been told that he can summon this ship with his mind. So now he needs flares for some reason, which is which is very weird. Yeah, but, I was wondering about that, too. Why, why does he need the flares now? But while he's out there, there are two guys in a car that are following him. So again, this adds to this narrative that he's being messed with, he's being followed. So like it's kind of a men in black situation. And this is at a time when the men in black aren't no, they aren't dubbed that, and they won't be dubbed that until John Keel comes around. I mean, we we have Gray Barker with uh, they knew too much about flying saucers and Fifty Six talking about this, but this is uh, you know relatively new, and he just like you know steps on the gas, gets out of there, and at this point, Truman changed job sites. He moves to Arizona. And he starts working on a dam, uh, Davis Dam, as a welder. 
And while he's out there, he has his last experience. So he's told to go on a trip to Kingman, Arizona. Now, it would be a year later when there would be a supposed UFO crash in Kingman, Arizona in 1953. It's you know, one of those highly speculative UFO incidents, but it is interesting that he was there like a year before it happened. But November 2nd, he makes the trip. He's going on his way back, headed actually for Mormon Mesa. And he used one of the flares to summon or ship and on board. Uh, they talk. She warns them, warns him that there would be fatal accidents during the construction of this dam. And Five days later, there was a man that was killed, and it was in that incident that uh, he injured, I think it was his ankle. And a few days later, there were three more men that were injured. And So Rob, do we know of anyone else who had a weird encounter on November 2nd, about 14 <laughs> years later? Yeah, so there's a couple of weird things 14 years later. So that is the date of... Woodrow Derenberger's encounter with injured cold. But for those listening, what you may not know is there was a man born on that day that um, he a happens to be on this call right now. And it is it is fortuitous that he was born on November 2nd, 1966. His name is Richard Haddam. Yes. And as you know, he went on to write a script for a movie called The Mothman Prophecies. It all comes full circle. It's Everything is connected, Everything is connected, as you can tell. Yes. It, does, uh, it does come full circle. Yeah. The thing about November 2nd is that it is, you know, Dia de los Muertos, the uh, yeah. Day of the Dead. And it's two days after Halloween, and it is traditionally yeah. the time when the when the veil between the dimensions and the worlds is at its thinnest, and the you know the ghosts and the world of the dead can mingle with the living, and the fairies come out of the fairy realm and ride on their mad ride through the Irish countryside, and you know all these things happen right around that time, and it's interesting that this is the time that she starts predicting doom. Mm -hmm. and death and it comes true so i i think it's worth pointing out also dam building is very dangerous i remember what stuck with me as a kid i think driving by grand coulee dam as a family on a road trip my dad telling me it's like yeah there's several guys buried in the concrete there like what and it's a little yeah. kid like what do you mean it's like <laughs> i mean how many so people died you, making the hoover dam it was quite yeah. a bit yeah. Well, here's the deal. It, it, it involves Truman a little bit. If you're if you're talking about uh, being a batch plant manager, uh, that he's responsible for the mix of concrete. And so when you're filling in that much concrete, you have guys, you, you'll see old documentaries. Their job is to kind of basically shove the, you know, place the concrete, make sure it's flowing the right places. It's coming out of the chute real fast. They're on a, a very tight deadline schedule. And mm -hmm. sometimes those guys slip in and now you've got, uh, you know, five tons of concrete on top of you before they can pull you out. Yeah. You're literally in the mix. Right. And what freaked me out as a kid, it's like, you could drive by like, yeah, those are, those guys are in there. Like if you could chip them out, uh, and give them a proper burial, uh, but it's never going to happen. They're just, they're just in there, but at least, you know, where they're at. I, I don't mean to be morbid about that, but like, that's, if I, I mean, I thought about that as a kid, it's like, well, you know, if I were to die in there, it's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just part of that now. And I'm always in there. And you know where I am, but it wouldn't be hard to guess. That's my point with her. It's just like, oh, you're building a dam. Well, people are going to die. It's like, well, yeah, yeah most likely Basically. people are going to die. Yeah. So I think the most important question here is, Rich, if you had been born on All Saints Day, what kind of Rich Adam would we have gotten? <laughs> <laughs> the sugar skull rich. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like that. Sugar I do too. Yeah. Rich. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Or you know, looking like uh, uh, James Bond in that uh, the second of the last movie there. Where oh like, right, when they go yeah, to uh, yeah, when they have the whole Day of the Dead thing. Yeah, right, yeah. right. It's cool. Yeah, this is the last contact that he has with Aura Reigns. It still becomes an obsession for Truman to get his wife up here, and I I think they were pretty close to divorcing at this point, but uh, they would divorce <laughs> in 1956 anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, she actually cited Aura Reigns on the divorce papers as it was. So that is <laughs> the end of this context. Uh, he decides to bury the remaining flare in 
yeah, he just for some reason he has no desire to see Aura ever again after this. And in early 1953, in uh, February, he gets a letter from George Adamski expressing curiosity because mm. the story's gotten out. It's been printed in the Redondo Beach newspaper and, mm-hmm. and such. So he decides, hey, come down and meet me. And the first thing that he has to do to prove to his wife that he's sane is to go visit his daughters and get a clean bill of health from them. And they both say, hey, he's totally sane. He's never been crazy like this before. Mm -hmm. So they attest to that. They drive down, meet with the Domsky, tells him his story, and he kind of helps him get on the lecture circuit. And that's where his story takes off you know if he had written it in his own hand and and it was self-published as you can do these days i don't think people would have taken this story as seriously and and the damsky may not have either one thing that i don't remember if we talked about yet or not was that he was repeatedly told he was going to go to the planet they were like we're taking you we're going to take you you're going you're going that never happened he never got that trip or if Mm -hmm. he did he certainly didn't tell anybody about it right he was invited over and over and they were like oh yeah and you can bring your friends and all you have to do is wear the good shoes apparently bring one change of clothes (laughs) and uh yeah yeah. so there was that part of it which i thought was interesting in the story especially if it's a hoax and everything is like well could he just not figure out the ending of his book i don't know or as ghostwriter they sat around like i don't know how do how do we top this how are we going to explain what clarion's like although they hadn't gone really that far but then the other thing, too, was uh, didn't he dig up the flare, the last flare later and try to use it and nothing happened, right? He, yeah, 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 I do believe so. Yeah, he dug it up mm. and lit it and and they didn't come, which maybe would have been the trip that would have taken him. Yeah, you know? it's like the key fob on a, on a modern car. Right. You're too far away from it, it doesn't work. Or they took him and wiped his memory of the experience. I mean, who knows? Uh, so that's well, like, okay, now you're getting into territory where maybe this is all one big screen memory. Right, that's what I'm saying. In a way that is so, a lot more different than I've heard before in that it is repeated, it's all one strung together narrative, nothing's conflicting. It's not like he walked into the, the spaceship and there's a Jeff Koons exhibit there. You know what I'm saying? Koons, like, just like, yes. well, this makes weird dreamlike sense. Like, this is all dream mm-hmm. imagery and it only makes sense in your subconscious. It's pretty sensible. <laughs> right, right. All the way, even the diner experience, except for her disappearing. It's like they go through a portal, like zip, you know, right and uh, right on board. And then they the way they take off too is he's always describing them as, uh, I turned around and the spaceship was just gone. Yeah. Not like yeah. it's, pew, you know, there's a, and the way they come in is like a falling star, changing Sometimes. colors and blue greens. Yes. And then, and then the browns, you know, the burnt oranges and reds, and then they're just there. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. very, the way they show up and disappear is very dreamlike. And so it's it's very odd. And like I said, but for a screen memory, you always hear them. It's just like, there's something absurd that didn't make sense. It's like, well, we pulled in and here's a Christmas store in the middle of Tonopah, a deserted lot with no driveway. And it's just here in July and it's all lit up. We don't remember going in. Next thing we know, five hours are missing. Right. Right. And yeah. he was like, there's always things that don't really make sense, but this is well, he mentions early kind of so on, sensible. he does mention some lost time. At one point, he only says that once, though. It, there's there's some point yeah. in the book where he says, I went in and it seemed like I wasn't in there very long, but when I came mm-hmm. out, clearly more time had passed. But he only said that once. Okay. He did only say that once. And right. I think right. that was right. early on. Well, folks, we're going to, this is going to wrap up part one. You're going to want to come back for part two because that's when we're going to get really into the weeds on this because. Rob has really done his homework on that. We have a lot of really great information and questions, and we're going to get down to the theories of what's going on here that go way beyond whether or not this is a hoax. So uh, we hope yeah. uh, that you guys will come back, but like, we're going to talk about theosophy. <laughs> we're going to talk about... Oh, it's it's so connected to the occult, and I think most people don't realize that because it's it's that's not the part of popular culture that's often explored. And the connections to, as Scott just said, theosophy metaphysics and the occult and it and these guys a lot of these guys were really into it and all of it may not have been terrific for uh you know world war ii and beyond it's so tied in with that 
with these characters and this era. And Rob has done a terrific job of, I know, compiling a lot of information on that. And I think you're going to be quite fascinated by it. So if you thought that flying saucers were woo, part two is going to put a double woo on that to make it the woo woo. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome, listeners. You <laughs> are times incredibly two. welcome for it. Uh, yes. Well, thank you guys so much. We'll have you back on uh, for the next episode. Rich, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, folks, we'll see you in two weeks. That's going to wrap up part one of our two-part series on Truman Bathurum and the story he told in his book, Aboard a Flying Saucer. We'll be back in two weeks with part two. Meanwhile, join our Patreon to hear us on the much more candid Astonishing Junk Drawer at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at BW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, the mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Hi, I'm Kirk. Alrighty. My name is spelled slowly and clearly. K-I-R-K. B-A-R. Mike. Echo Romeo Zulu. Galaxy wide in perpetuity. I understand this is with no implied promise of present or future compensation. Hi. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Caressia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at deadstreetproductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>